Hey everyone, welcome to the Rock Fantasy Files. We got a freaking awesome episode today. We're going to talk about 1994, the year the devil came to earth for real. <laughs> uh, so we'll be talking about that. I'll be the host today, replacing Mr. Stephen Keeler, who's taking another leave of absence. Uh, I think he's fed up hanging out with us. I don't know. I'm going to have to talk to him. Yeah, he's sick of our uh, shit. <laughs> So uh, the um, the album we'll talk about the, the today's episode was suggested by our Nor Norwegian vampire Mr. Ov. Uh, who will talk about why he did he did this uh, suggested this ep episode. Uh, but the four albums we're gonna look uh, we're gonna discuss today are uh, Cannibal Corpse, The Bleeding, uh, 1994, April 12th. Uh, then Incantation, Mortal Throne of Nazarene, October 25th, uh, released October 25th. Cryptopsy, Blasphemy Made Flesh, November 24th. And then another uh, November 28th release, Bull Thrower for Victory. So it's like a uppercut, punch in the face, kick in the nuts, and then choke hole, like uh, one album after the other. So like, Ovi, why don't you tell us... Um, why you uh, listen to such uh, angry music, my friend? <laughs> well, it must be the Norwegian darkness and the cold, I guess. <laughs> Something to warm yourself on. <laughs> no, it's just when you're growing up and you're like getting angry and you get like frustrated with society and whatnot, then it's good to have something to get out your frustration on. And death metal, I feel, is, is built for us that mm -hmm. way. Perfect soundtrack to your uh, to your environment. Yeah, for this definitely, it's definitely so emotional. It's so much emotion in it. It's like it you, you get so much fuel inside to just get it out when you listen to death metal. So for me, it's it's perfect. Awesome. Also, awesome. the albums the albums I've chosen is 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 my favorite albums of each band. So I put myself kind of in a in the corner here, but I gotta see if I can fight myself way out. Awesome. Awesome. Well, great, uh, great uh, suggestion. And no thank you to uh, make us have to go through this and try to pick and decide which one is which. So I think I think we're going to have to get you back for that somehow. <laughs> we'll yep. find a way to get you back uh, on the panel That's today. Perfect. Yeah. <laughs> on the panel today, we have, like I said, our friend Ovi from Norway. We have Stephen, the Tasmanian devil. Levin, who always goes against the grain, doesn't have any friends, fights with everyone about everything. <laughs> <laughs> then we have the local Middletown historian, Mr. Count Ralphus, with us. We have the lovely Stacy Stanton. Thank you, Stacy Stacey, Tracy, for joining Tracy. us. Yes. Yeah, glad to be we here. Have, we have Miles Bergeron, Mr. Louisiana, Miles with Metal, and of course, the Grand Master of Death. Doom, destruction, and despair, Mr. John McEntee. Thank you for joining all, all us. So, uh, what are we gonna do, guys? Um, like we discussed, uh, we'll go to our uh, choice number four first, uh, and we'll go uh, one by one and discuss why it's our number four and what we like, dislike uh, about um, about these albums. So, for let's start with. I'll just go. By the way, I see you on my screen. I'll start. Let's start with uh, Mr. Ovi uh, up in Norway. If you want to go with your uh, fourth selection, okay. My number four is is well. This band um, was pretty known for its brutality and stuff, and um, also was featured in in a movie. So they got pretty famous uh, for me in Norway. Listening to Underground. Um, they kind of got a little, I don't know, got a little bad uh, because they got popular because of Ace Ventura movie. But at the other hand, the underground kind of, uh, what's this? This is ours, man. But yeah, uh, Cannibal Corpse is is my number four of these. I really like this album because it's it's such a big difference from the three first albums. I guess with Rob coming into the picture and it's more technical. Uh, uh, Barnes has changed his vocal type that is 
done a lot today with actually growling so you hear what they say kind of more have more groove to it i guess he took it with him to six feet under afterwards but i really like this album because it's like no other album of theirs and it kind of formed how they progress today it's kind of a recharge from the three first albums uh songs i really like is is uh, an experiment in homicide uh strip raped and strangled of course and my for favorite is forced fed the broken glass awesome 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 do you want to give us like uh ed's pick while you're uh what what did what did ed add at number four uh ed did number four he did um cryopsy cryptopsy yep Okay, perfect. All right, thank you, OB. Now, let's go to Mr. Levin. Evie Levin. Hello, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here as always. Uh, for me, this was a, a tough one. Uh, I've got to go back and listen to a couple albums I haven't listened to for a while. And um, my number four choice is going to be Bolt Thrower for Victory. It's a great album. Um, if I was going to give it in a numeric rating system, I would give this one an eight out of ten. It's not my favorite Bolt Thrower. That... Uh, Honor goes to uh, Realm of Chaos. Uh, Bolt Thrower was just the amazing band. They had such great imagery. They had all the Warmaster 40K. I'm sorry, the, uh, was that the name of it? Warmaster? Warhammer. Warhammer. Warhammer, yes. I got the little tongue tied there. Uh, 40K, the art, um, especially with like the albums back in the day, the art was just amazing. It went all around the uh, the cover and everything on the inside and the booklet. It's it's just so cool. And uh, the artwork always matched the music, which is just so heavy. It has a very, I would say, like almost that Swedish, that Stockholm sound, that famous sound that's just so huge. And I mean, it, it really does. It sounds like war. And I mean, every song on this album is great. I really don't have anything bad to say about this album. It's just not my favorite out of the four. I would say that... Uh, the one thing that I don't like about it is it's really consistently mid tempo. It doesn't really step out of the box with like blast parts or anything like that. So it kind of goes at one pace, but I think that just lends to the heaviness. And when you see bands like this live, I mean, that's really what you want because when it gets too techy, it's very hard to really keep track of and bang your head. So really great head banging album, super solid uh, favorite songs are lest we forget uh graven image. And uh, I love the song remembrance. Very nice. Very nice. All right. So Walter or number four for you. Yes. Awesome. Thank you so much. All right. Thank let's you. go with um, Count Ralphus, your number four pick. All right. So I got this demo in like 93, the Cryptopsy demo, and then picked this up in 94. Love this album. Got to see Lord Worm play with them in like uh, 2005 when he rejoined the band. They toured with Suffocation and aboard it. Um, I, I think all four of these albums are really great, and this is a hard one. But this is the one I spent the least amount of time with. But uh, I can't say anything bad at all about it. For being so fast and brutal, it's actually still catchy at times. Um, I love the song Abby Gore. It's a real memorable one off the album. Um, yeah, and I, I've been listening to their, their newest one a lot lately. I... Uh, think this is really kick-ass a lot cleaner production mm -hmm. this is a little bit more raw back then which is expected from the early albums by bands back then but uh still still holds up great today great album but i gotta pick it at number four awesome are they are they coming out with uh dead to all in, in your neck of the woods as well i know they're, they're playing yeah, in vancouver they're, yeah they're playing the gramercy and they're yeah they're opening up for death to all yeah, should be that should be a good uh, drumming clinic, uh, Gene and Flo. Uh, yeah, back to back to back. <laughs> awesome, thank you, thank you so much, Ralph. Uh, now let's go with Tracy, your number four pick. Uh, I would have to go with Cryptopsy also. Nice. Um, it just didn't. Um, actually, my whole perspective changed as I got older with the all of these albums. Because uh, I'm a Cannibal Corpse fan, but um, needless to say, later on we're gonna find out that 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 changed up a little bit. But um, 
but um, I, I mean, I loved it. it. Really brought out a technical feel, and I really enjoyed that highly. But again, I think the production at that point in time had a big influence on where this was placed. And just that the other three albums are still phenomenal, too. It was hard with these four albums. But I must honestly say that if you asked me in 94 and you asked me now, you've got two different perspectives on all of these albums. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. It's funny how through the years, how like your 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 ears ear the material in a different manner. Uh, yeah, I think I, 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 went I think it's the progression how yeah. metal transformed from that point in time to now and actually looking back at it i'm like like in a one two three i'm like i already had my list made out then as i went back and i'm like i really wish i could move them up because it was a, technically an amazing album and it was a break in through you know technical death metal so yeah. you know I, I, I really want to bring it up on the list, but I've just got some certain favorites amongst here. <laughs> awesome. 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 Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. Miles of Metal. You're up, buddy. Number four. No, your choice number four. All right. I want to start off by saying this was the hardest episode I've ever done. This is nice. this was, but I will say this is the most enjoyable episode I've ever done. Because in it, in my opinion, all these albums are 10 out of 10s. They're all great. And if you ask me tomorrow, like I have my ranking that I took forever to do to get these albums the way I wanted it. But if you ask me tomorrow, it's probably going to change anyway. But yeah. so with all that out the way, coming in at number four, I hate to do this because it is my favorite Cannibal Corpse record. I love this record. Thank you. Um, you know, this is this has always been my favorite Cannibal Corpse record. Um, I think that John's best friend Chris Barnes sounds great on this record. I think this is in my personal in my personal opinion, this is uh um, yeah. his best vocal performance ever. Definitely, definitely. And um I I mean honestly, this is to me personally, this is Cannibal Corpse greatest hits. You know, you got Strip Raped and Strangled. That is a great song. That opening riff, if you can't get down to that opening riff, you don't like death metal. You know, you got Pickaxe Murders, Pulverize. You got the title track. She was asking for it. But probably my favorite song off this is Ford Fe Forced Fed Broken Glass. Um, 10 out of 10 record. I love this record. I hate to put it at four, but today as it stands, that's where I'm putting it at. You can blame Obi. It's all Obi's fault. Oh, I blame Obi a hundred percent for this. Torture that I, had. I will put up more <laughs> interesting battles because I really go into it and make it like most difficult as I can, just for the heck of it. It's like uh, Mr. Keeler making me listen to Queen's Rag the Warning. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I needed I needed some thumbs and Pepto for that one. Anyway, we went. I still it. have a bad taste in my mouth from that. Hey, we have to all take all of the flame, right? Yeah. Oh, no, we don't. <laughs> all right, John, you do you want to play with us? You want to like uh to, to rank uh, the four album as well? Yeah, well, first of all, I can't rank I can't rank my album with the other three albums cuz okay, so it's, it's like so wrong and it just doesn't You get a pass. You can go with the other three. They're com they're completely different um you know, different reasons why I, you know, whatever. So, um, yeah. yeah, so I guess, I, I mean, just just for the hell of it, I have to put uh, Moral Thumb of Nazarene at four just because I, I'm really just not rating it because I, how do you rate your own stuff? You're so critical of it. You can't enjoy it like other people enjoy it. Um, that being said, for that album, I mean, we already did an episode on Ecan and I kind of explains some of the, drama and, and issues with it um you know listening back to it you know of course i pick out all the stuff that i don't like about it of course but um i in my opinion i think it's sad the way it worked out on that album with the band because um basically we went onto this album with just myself and craig pillar together going into it and we 
had a lineup with uh, John Brody and Dave Nedris were uh, in the band at the time. And um, the situation, uh, Brody just wasn't ready to go into the studio to record. And um, we ended up asking Jim to come back to do the album, which was a smart idea and I think really helped out the album. But at the same time, it made the situation really awkward because we're asking someone to come back that was basically left the band because he thought I was an asshole. So it made for the session to be really stressful. And But at the same time, out of all that like uh, stress and anger and uh, sadness, um, you know, we came up with something that was not um, not exactly what we were planning on, something that, you know, that had a real uh, passion to it, I think, if nothing else. Um, you know, but it was really, my takeaway from that is like, it's an example of um, how sad it was that we had to basically like fall apart to get this album done. And uh, immediately after this album, like, even before it was released, I think Craig left the band. So it was just a total, uh, you know, a total downer for me because when we did our first demo to Agatha, I thought it was going to be the four of us for the rest of our lives. And we're going to keep kicking ass and doing albums. And then, Unfortunately, um, doesn't work out that way. But yeah. Other guys should probably take responsibility for kind of fucking up a good thing, we'll say. The album ends up coming out good, and at the time, it was not looking back. It's, I mean, I have to be proud of it because of all the um, influence that it had on people and the fact that maybe about 15, 20 years ago, people started opinions on how much they liked it. At the time, I think everyone just thought we were just on crack or whatever because they couldn't understand what the hell was going on with this album. Uh, I, I don't like to use the word ahead of it. It kind of was because we fit in with the music scene now with that album more than we do. At that time, at that time, what is this album? Like, because it was just so different than. Um, so even the three year, it's almost like the standout album as far as different goes. Maybe not better, but definitely. That's all yeah, I can but... say. I don't know if I can say more, but I don't want to just babble on about how yeah. terrible um, the recording of the album. <laughs> I want to be a dead. Yeah, because your because your like compilation that came out has a track from the original recording on it. Well, no, no that was actually its own recording. Uh, May say the holy figure track was um, was it the that was actually the test run that we wanted to go to the studio to record the album, and the moral I mean the uh, the version that was on I think it was um, corporate death that was on or it was some some relapse comp it was on, and we were pretty happy with how that song came out. But then we got to the studio uh, to record the album, it seemed like the whole thing changed. The engineer wanted to make us into a uh, fear factory or something like that. And um, he also was playing on the fact that there was so much um, turmoil in the band that he was kind of playing us against each other in the studio. So I have really bad experiences of recording that album. It was, just, it was really, 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 really annoying. I, I felt like I just, even though I wrote a large amount of music on there, I kind of felt like I lost some of my, um, some of my direction i had to fight really hard to get things back on track to make it a how it came out and even how it came out wasn't how we wanted it to come out it was only the best we could do with the budget restrictions that we had it was it's it's so much of a i mean the whole this whole al album situation from start to finish could be its own like you know small novel on how insane it was and how stressful and how much of an impact it had on my life and just how sad and how upset I was that these people that I, you know, was in the band with and thought we were going to jam forever was like basically milking out every last bit of anything. All, all, you know, Jim, myself and Craig had to get this album done. And then it was just like there was nothing left after that. We were all like, you know, we all like, see you, fuck off, everybody, you know, <laughs> it was really sad. So, so on Wikipedia, in, on Wikipedia, it says that you guys recorded the album back in '93, and then the 
there was that thing with the record company and you had to record it all over again. But does that original version of the whole album that you wanted really, does it exist? No. And that, that's, that, that information is wrong too. We didn't, okay. all we did, all we did was record um, Ace Hate the Holy Figure in um, 93. If I'm, yeah, it was 93. Yeah. 94, early, I think it was early 94. I don't remember exactly when we went in the studio, but we only recorded it one time. And the, the, um, Rough mix that was the um, upon the throne of apocalypse is basically the um, rough mix of the album that we had. Um, we we just sent it to relapse. We wanted to show them the progress because at that point we were pretty happy with how it was going. And then it was almost like as soon as we sent them that copy and they they liked the way it was, everything went to shit in the studio. Um, it mostly went to shit towards the end of the basic tracking which that album is pretty much the basic tracking for the album it has it has fuck ups on it and stuff too but it was just it was never meant to be released it was released uh, by relapse and um the, you know the ex members at that time as a kind of a swipe towards me and a way for a way for relapse to make money and for those guys to kind of get back at me for continuing the band without them and stuff and i mean i'm fine with it now at the time obviously it was a drama and i'm I was really pissed off at our record company. The record company released an album, an incantation album, pretty much behind my back, which I would have been all for them. Really, they would have just, you know, or whatever. But they're trying to um, pin all of us together for a bunch of reasons. There's business reasons why Relapse did it too, but I don't want to get into all the um, minutia of it. But I understand. Just, um, yeah, but anyway, it was all one recording, and. Um, I think most of the guitar tracks, though, on more were re-recorded because those were almost all the scratch tracks that we did. So that's almost like a live version of the album. And the, um, the well, yeah, the Upon the Throne was a live version and Moral Throne was the mixed version. But the mixed version got, uh, we had a $600 budget to mix the album and we spent like uh, probably $12,000 recording it and doing uh, not even getting to mix in the studio. So you could see the the uh, discrepancy with the amount of money that we had to record it and then the amount of money we had to mix it was just like 600 bucks. Like, we, <laughs> you know, basically had to rush in the studio and just do whatever. And, and you know, that was a whole thing in itself, trying to beg the guy, in this, uh, the guy at um, a different studio to mix it as a favor to me, um, you know, which was, it was all disaster. But it, somehow it worked out. <laughs> Uh, the reason why I asked because if the if the Wikipedia thing was true and it's thirty years ago, it would kind of nice that you got to release the album as your vision was back then. Finally, yeah, but no, since it wasn't. Not, so no, neither neither version is is any of our vision necessarily. Um, okay. I mean, if you, I'm, I, I mean, I think if you asked any of the people involved in the album, they're all going to say that we weren't happy with the way it turned out. Um, and we, there was a time when we were going to try to remix it and, you know, get together with the, the guys and stuff after we kind of made up and whatnot, but it never came to fruition. And at, at this point, it's like, there's two versions of the album out. What do we want to mix another one the way we like it now? It's like, we don't need three versions of the album. It's, just, it's what it is. And we, you know, accept it for what it is. And, and I do like, I, I think there's aspects to both that are good. And I think the, um, you know, the, songs i'm happy with and stuff you know we play a lot of songs till this day and um yeah but I'm not, i think re remixing it the way we want it. and if we had we had to mix it we'd have to do it with myself uh jim and craig because you know they were the guys that recorded the stuff and we all need to be there and do it but i just don't see it happening not because there's any issues with them it's just i don't think anyone has will it's like fuck it it's what 30 years okay. old get over it you know okay <laughs> thank you thank you John. It's, it's just you have a lot of questions because there's a lot of what you call it uh, myth around that album because of a, their... a lot of controversy and a lot of yeah. a lot of different things and plus different people remember different parts of it so you know i'm sure there's yeah. stuff about the recording that craig and jim remember that i don't remember as parts i you know i remember they don't remember so you know when you're yeah. talking that long ago you're going to start things are going to start getting a little more um you know, cloudy, I guess, you know, you can, you can only remember so much of a recording 30 years ago, you know? 
<laughs> like Especially studio. when you were in the studio, like almost every two, one, two years, like often recording, right? Yeah. And it, 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 like sometimes, like I, I miss, I mix two stories. <laughs> yeah, you try, you try not to, but it just, it just yeah. happens. It's like, you know, passage of time and stuff. Um, the best thing, you know, with those kind of things, the best way to remember studio stuff is to get together with all the people that were in the studio and talk about those things. And you kind of are able to hash out yeah. some of the discrepancies and stuff, you know, but, you know, I, I haven't talked about this album with those guys for at least 15 years or something. So I'm still trying to remember the best I can. I just remember that I was really upset with it. If anything, I was stressing out because us, our first album did really well. And then we had another album that was a total disaster to do, you know, and, and we had no lineup. <laughs> yeah. All right, all right. Thank you so much. Uh, we'll get back to uh, to this album uh, as uh, we go through our list. Uh, I'll go with my fourth pick. Uh, for me, it's Cannibal Corpse, uh, The Bleeding. Um, I never been a huge Cannibal Corpse fan until more more recently with some of their newer shit. That it's like, you know, it's so heavy and so well done. But like, I think way back. I was so uh, I was so into like uh, other bands like uh, I don't know maybe I was young and, and kind of like uh, stubborn I guess but you know for me back then it was more like about Morbid Angel and Brutal Truth uh, and and, uh, and 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 Tomb uh, and Incantation and stuff like that so I, I was not um, I always felt like Cannibal Corpse at that time even though it it is like technically that metal I, I felt like their riffing and the uh the influence and how it was presented sounded more like a angry trash music uh yeah just, i agree 100 percent. just the way that it's delivered it's not the same as like covenant morbid angel or, or uh left hand pat it's not the same delivery the the messaging is just as fuck like i mean if you <laughs> If you, <laughs> it's it's uh, definitely like that metal message, but I I find like the riffing to me sounded more like uh, some of these like uh, uh, late eighties uh, trash band. Uh, X order, uh, yeah, yeah, sounded a little bit more like that. So that's it. That's my my favorite song. I really like. Well, even though like okay, I I, I was not into that. Um, listening to the album for the first time in a very long time today and going to the lyrics i had a blast i had to tell my kids hey check this song called fuck with a knife uh, <laughs> yeah so it, it, it's uh it's 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 really like hard to like forget about that song same with like strip raped and strangle um and i i do like the the bleeding uh they have this really weird like uh, a guitar arrangements like that too uh, to guitar harmony uh, that they kind of try to to do tr throughout the album and uh, doesn't always work as well as some of the records we'll we'll talk later on. So yeah, number four, Cannibal Corpse for me. All right, um, let's go with and I did I talk about uh, no I didn't talk about Mr. Keeler and Frank Tosi's pick yet, right? No, no, not yet. Did no. I say it? Okay. So uh, Stephen uh, Keeler, uh, number four, is Cryptopsy. And Frank's number four is also Cryptopsy. Uh, so that's what is the, their pick for the number four. All right. So now let's go into number three, and we'll go back, circle back to Norway with Ovi for your number three pick, my friend. Yeah. Um, no, my number three is uh, Cryptopsy. Cryptopsy didn't have – I talked to my, like, my mentor that taught me a little about metal and stuff. And and Cryptopsy didn't really have any distribution. Well, they had distribution if you really dug in deep and like stuff, but like they didn't become like a name before the next album. And even after that, when they were real released as a double package. So uh, because he said to me he would definitely sell me this album uh, at his store if he had it in store because it's it's a brutal piece of art. So for me, like, this is the album I have got latest into, like the one I discovered last of all these. But um, the album, the reason also I picked all these albums is because they are so different. It's like, 
that's what I like about this. It's like death metal. All death metal it sounds all the same. Like my ass. It's so many different layers. Um, but this album is so it's so brutal and it's like so chaotic and it's like you gotta listen to it like more times to absorb everything that goes on 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 the album. Uh, for me, the my favorite songs is like Mutant Christ, Open Face Surgery, and Pathological Frolic. I think is my favorite. The last track. <laughs> yeah, crazy lyrics by. Uh, I told you guys la like last time we talked. Like Lord Worm is a is a university professor. Yeah, uh, which is scary in itself in so many ways, but. Uh, <laughs> He, you know, like he, he's he's very poetic, and and how he describes like things that are completely absurd and 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 you know like very dark. Uh, so it's uh it's definitely like uh, just reading the lyrics is is a trip in itself. I even without well, it's the same thing with with Carcass with Ken Owen. He is he's yeah. like working at the mortuary. He is the one that came up all with uh, yeah. like the third album. Uh, the criticism is like seven ways of disposing of a body. It's like that's the whole album principle of the whole album is to get dispose of bodies. Carcass <laughs> improve our medical terminology. All of us, yeah, like, definitely, like, like, definitely. <laughs> Awesome. First song I ever heard of them was Ebronic Necropsy and Devourment. I was like, hee haw. <laughs> <laughs> let's uh, go. All right. Thank you so much. All right. Let's go with Mr. Levin. You're next, buddy. Okay. So for me, my number three pick is Cannibal Corpse the Bleeding. It's not my favorite Cannibal Corpse album. I actually like uh, George much better as a vocalist than Chris. Uh, nothing against Chris, you know, I mean, he definitely had a lot to do with the formation of the type of vocals that gets, you know, and you hear a lot these days, but I don't know, at a certain point, it didn't seem like he was truly committed to the calls. I don't know if that's the right thing to say or not, but it just got to be more like, it seemed like it was more of just like an act to try to like, just push like the most like absurd, like stuff. And I mean, just with the titles of the, the songs, it, it kind of comes across as that. But uh, that being said, the songs are super tight. It's really crisp, like Danny had alluded to. It's very thrash oriented, but with um, just a little bit, you know, it's got some blast beats in there a little bit. And uh, his vocals obviously are leaning more towards the death metal side. Uh, you can never say anything bad about Alex. I mean, he is one of the best bass players that have ever played in death metal. He is a tremendous musician, a great human being. He'll always take time to talk to you and share a story with you. He's a great guy. So, uh, yeah, uh, my favorite songs on this one are Strip Rape and Strangled. I love Pulverize, uh, Picks, Pickaxe Murders, and uh, She Was Asking For It. Had a great trem solo at the beginning, and then that heavy, heavy slow part, which I just love. It just makes you want to bang your head and punch your fist through the wall or something like that. So, yeah, for, for me, it's number three. Uh, once again, nothing wrong with this album. Just not my favorite Cannibal Corpse. And uh, if I was going to give it numeric rating, I would rate this just a little bit higher than uh, the Bolt Thrower. I'd give this one an 8.5 out of 10. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you, my friend. Uh, <laughs> let's go, Count Ralphus. You're next, buddy. All right. Um, so, yeah, uh, John was talk just talking about it, and uh, he's putting it down, but at the same time, he's always got it hanging up right behind him in every episode he's ever done on Rock Fantasy. <laughs> but uh, well, yeah, I got proud, it. proud to get through it. I got this autographed one, and I pulled out the upon the, the apocalypse one. Uh, that autograph too. When John was at my house a long time ago, that he doesn't probably remember. But uh, I remember. Yeah, I love this you album. You did some art for us for that Infernal Storm album. All that inside yeah. art was all Ralphie's. Yep, and you, you, Jens, oh, right? Yeah. Nice. And uh, I think he's got went to Rock Fantasy that day too. But uh, yes, yeah, I love this album. But um, after I went to Golgotha, it was like a, a step down for me. And I think the production, like you were saying, is is the main thing. Like I love the vocals, and he's got such a unique vocal style, Craig Pillard. But it's so much yeah, louder than on the first album. It seemed like it needed to be louder. Like he sounds like he's still singing the same way. It's got that hellish. <laughs> vocal style but it just it didn't seem loud as, as it was on on the first album and but there's so, like even saying that there's some real classic i mean nocturnal dominion and in the song the ibex moon they're they're freaking classic real catchy so the songs are there it's just a, a little bit on the production 
could have been better. And there was really nobody like these guys at the time. And it's it's, it's a great album, but I'm going to have to put it at number three. Yeah, All right, real cool. quickly, talking about those. Uh, oh, Craig's and, and I got, oh, I also got the vintage. Uh, long oh, the old, series. yes. Awesome. Nice. Kind of like right. the Black Winds of Death. I... Yes. <laughs> yeah. yeah, hellish cavernous doom death growls. Yeah, he, he, one thing for sure is Craig is impressive just for the time period. You know? Yeah. All right. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Cal, Ralphus. Uh, now let's go with uh, Tracy. You're up next. Number okay. Three. Um, believe it or not, I'm going to bring it on to the Cannibal Corpse. Yeah, and that's unusual for me because um, I'm a big Cannibal Corpse fan. But like Steve said, I appreciate them more with George. Um, and I think it just ended up being so... They, they were following a trend. You know what I'm saying? And this was the last one with Chris Barnes. Not that I... That... Not that I think that they knew that at the moment, but um, again, it has some of my favorite songs that I love hearing at any Cannibal Corp show. But again, I think it was approached to be more for um, a more mass-based year. So that's where I have to go with that. I mean, other albums that we have coming up had definitely um more technical work done in it and definitely more influential moves so um i think it was you know and uh we were so looking forward to this album because we were just looking forward to it and i think like half of the album really took a, a gave it to us what we wanted and other songs just sort of really let us kind of down a little bit, you know, in terms of the technical play and some of the songs. So I, I really have to say that this has to be three, even though I'm a big Cannibal Corpse fan. I think even back then we were like disappointed with the title, like the bleeding was too, not enough Cannibal Corpse. Like Yeah, it wasn't, <laughs> didn't give it got enough grit. Yes, yes, you know, we needed to reach like, to the next level, mm -hmm. and they weren't reaching. They sort of, they yeah. sort of gave us what we wanted in certain aspects and other aspects. Um, I think we were ready to see the next move in Cannibal Corpse. We definitely were. Also, the artwork. I understand because the artwork in itself, when it's full, it's awesome as fuck. But they just zoomed into flesh. Uh huh. Yep. Yeah. Well, I think they did that probably because of all the crap they got for Tumen to mutilate and getting like banned. And, and butchered at and birth. Stuff. Yes, yeah, we were being at birth was the one. Yeah, that was right. Butchered at birth was. I think they're maybe they're trying to play it safe just to make sure that the record gets in the stores in Germany or something. Maybe they should yeah. just did like a, a German version of it, you know, with like, you know, yeah. I don't know, a pink heart on it or something, you know? There you go. That's a cool artwork right there. Yes. Yeah, much better. The vintage 1994 tour shirt. Oh, nice. Nice. Yeah, killer. All right, let's go to Miles of Metal. My old buddy, number three. He's on mute. Oh, he's on mute. Miles, you're on mute. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> so, uh, but number three. I'm going with uh, Incantation, Moral Throne of Nazarene. Got it right here. Um, I'm not going to lie. The first time I heard this record, and after hearing the first record from Incantation, I heard was Onward to Golgotha. And then going into this one, I, I really didn't like it, to be honest with you. But the more time I spent with it, I really did get into the songs more. But I agree with Ralph. Um, the, the vocals for me are kind of buried in the mix a little bit. I wish they were a little bit more in front so, you know, I can get kind of like that onward to Golgotha feel. But the songs are there. Like, I couldn't agree with Ralph Moore with what he said. The songs are there. Like, the Ibex Moon 
to me is one of the staple death metal songs in my opinion like if you do not know that song you do not like death metal like that's just my <laughs> personal opinion every playlist i ever done with death metal the ibex moon is on it and you know nocturnal dominion is great you know demonic uh demonic incarnate that that ending slow part really got to me when you know getting into this album that slow part at the end really got into me i also pulled out uh upon the throne apocalypse right here um i like both versions um i think i like upon the throne of nazarene a little bit more but you know there's things i like about both so you know i i like this album enough to where i get it both times you know that's that's just how it is but i really do like this record i'd, I'd give it a 10 out of 10 in my personal opinion and uh but just for today in that this ranking that's what i'm going with at number three uh, one one comment though on that is i don't know if you guys ever heard it and i haven't checked on youtube for a while but someone put both of those albums versions and like overlaid them on top of each other and made a version with because it's the same it's the same drum tracks and stuff yeah. so it's some, somewhere on youtube you could do a search and i don't know what it's called i, I it was probably I heard about this over 10 years ago or something but yeah there's a version of it with like both mixes mixed together i i can't even remember what it sounds like because i i don't really get off on listening to my own stuff so i wasn't like i was excited about it. i just heard about it you know i just, I just like couple couple of I, I gotta check that out i gotta look for that it sounds like i just I got can... i just got one question for john i know that you know the stories between the two but what was the original track listing no, it's Moral Throne is the original track listing. I got you. Um, uh, the backwards track listing was not, I was not part of that uh, negotiation when it was done. That was between Relapse and uh, Craig and Jim, I think, that came up with the idea of doing it backwards. But they fucked up. Um, they fucked up uh, Iconoclism of Catholicism and um, the Emaciated Holy Figure on the Upon the Throne are actually backwards i think the the titles are backwards on. i can't remember but something i i know it's just fucked up because sometimes if i check it on like spotify or something like that the wrong song comes up because it's like backwards but the reason the reason why, the reason why i ask is because i feel like the track listing works great on both albums like no matter whether it's reverse or backwards they it like fits in perfectly no matter which way it is that's why i was asking well, I, I didn't. We didn't realize that's fine, but the, the album, in a way, kind of like starts and ends very similar. Yeah, so duh, kind of like, like bookends it because we did like probably what our most doomy songs were the first and the last. So when you reverse it in that structure, somehow yeah. it works. I was it not planning really that at all, you know. <laughs> yeah, it worked real good. Real nice. Thank you so much, Miles. Uh, John, pick number three. Okay, my number three is um, uh, Cryptopsy, uh, Blasphemy Made Flesh. Um, in general, I'm just not a huge Cryptopsy fan. I'm nothing really against them, but they've been they to me they bounce all over the place too much throughout the years, and it just it loses my interest. But I am a big fan of um, Lord Worm. I think his material Cryptopsy is superior to the other stuff. But it's it's just a more my wheel well because they have vocalists that I think sounded more hardcore almost at times. I uh, was like something big album or whatever, and then you know they've been kind of, they have a way wider variety of um, acceptable stuff to do with their band than I do, or you know my opinion or whatever. But I think uh, you know it's, it's a good album. It, Cryptopsy just isn't one of my overall favorite bands, but. I have a lot of respect for them and their talent is, you know, unquestionably some of the most talented musicians in death metal, especially, um, especially at the time it was super impressive to watch them play. But for me, if somebody's super talented, it only holds my attention for a little while. If I'm not really that much into the music, um, you know, and eh, it's okay album, whatever. I mean, I don't really have any, um, you know, favorite or not favorite tracks on it because Honestly, I don't know the album quite well enough. I actually probably listen to it more just because I'm friends with Lord Worm 
and checked out the album back in the day. But I was just into more, um, more underground, obscure, uh, crustier stuff at that time. I, I, when it came out, I didn't want to hear the the clean technical stuff. I, for me, especially back then, it was like the more dirt, the better. Mm -hmm. Very nice. Very nice. Very nice. Very nice. Uh pick from uh pick from uh Stephen Keeter at number three uh was a bull thrower. Uh and for Frank Tossi was also a bull thrower. And it's also my pick number three. Um I think Ed course, this number three is cannibal corpse. Oh perfect. Thank you. Uh, all right. Yeah. So, like, I, I, I think Voltroar. They, they have other albums I like. I like better. Uh, I always like their sound. Like, they have, like you said before, like that, like Swedish uh, kind of death metal sound into their their, their sound, and it, it's. Uh, but this one for me was. Um, I I I do believe, like, if you listen to like for Victory, I think it did influence a lot of newer acts, like. Yeah, you can there's a lot of bands right now that sounds a lot like that vibe they're trying to do with the dual guitars yeah. and all that like um you know even the song for victory uh for me always kind of reminded me same similar vibe to venom seven gates of l or, or that type of like uh, adventurous slower kind of grinding death metal uh so, uh, but yeah, I, I, you know, like th throughout the years, I think Bull Thrower is a band that uh, somewhat uh, lost my interest, but that when they came out, I know we, we used to listen to them quite a bit. Uh, but this album for me is at number three. All right. Okay, we're ready to go to round number two. And we'll start again with Ovi. Yes. So my number two is Incantation. Uh, this album was my introduction to proper death metal. I had listened to like uh, obituary and stuff, and I came to my friend that was older than me, and it's like, "Have you heard this band obituary?" It's like, of course he had. It's like he's the most brutal thing ever. Yeah, right. And they put on Incantation, Mortal Tone Master, and I was like, my nuts dropped. I'm like, what in the Sam Hill is this? Let's go. <laughs> Then, then I, I, then bought I, the album. I bought the album on a on a split second, and it's like it's my introduction to proper death metal. So for me, it's it's my like my ride lightning. It's like it opened a whole new world for me. So it was the first album I heard. I didn't hear Golgotha first, so I have a I have a emotional attachment to Nazarene. That's why it's my favorite album. Of, of yours because it's my first introduction to you guys and it's also my first introduction to proper death metal as my mentor said awesome. uh, my favorite my favorite yeah. songs is uh, Essence Ablaze and Ibex Moon of course and Nocturnal Dominion Nocturnal Dominion is is my favorite track ever of Incantation it's yeah it's the oh, shit yeah. I like awesome. it. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. I, I'm, just, I'm just happy that it worked because we it we weren't trying to make the most uh popular commercial death metal album. We wanted to make the most muddy, scary, evil, <laughs> uh corrupting people's mind album, you know. It was it wasn't it was like anti commercial. Like most of the commercial what, what we call commercial death metal back then, we're just like we're just we just want to take it a whole nother level to it. Um, as far as the the roughness, you know, bring that old school kind of uh, crusty punk, but also heavy as fuck and just, you know, evil and whatever. Just, you know, a total like fuck you kind of album. So, you know, talk a little about it's nice, good job. It's talk nice to know that. Artwork, John. What's that? Talk a little about the artwork because the artwork is phenomenal. Yeah, I mean, well, that was Ron Kim that did that one, you know, the same one that did a couple of our other albums, and she was great. I mean, it was just, um, I think it just fit the whole vibe. It was really important for us to have abstract artwork on the album, because 
we did want to like identify different than the other album other other bands that were coming out that were playing that metal and stuff. And yeah, yeah, between um Ron Kim and Wes Ben Scotter, they kind of captured both um both vibes great. Like the abstract artwork of Ron Kim was great. And then the, you know the more um I don't know what you want to call it, more it's not really line art, but just the, the art of um uh, Wes Ben Scotter really help bring out some of the dark evil vibes of it. I, I'm, I'm really happy with the artwork. I think it's, I think it came out really good. I mean, it fits the album. Yeah. For, for how much I bitch about it or whatever, when I hear it and, you know, I hear how money and raw it is, I'm happy with it because that's, that was my interpretation of what um, death metal was supposed to be, you know, and, um, you know, I think it had the elements of grind, it had the elements of, you know, kind of art metal or death metal influences and also a lot of our own personality to it and a lot of doom to it too a lot of um influenced by you know of course black sabbath but also like um you know candle mass and um and early like early early paradise lost like demo era paradise lost and stuff was a big yep. influence on that album too and, and early my dying bright influence on that I remember writing some of the stuff. I think uh, the first EP and into what the as the flower withers came out, and I definitely that that vibe definitely was an influence. Also, um, what was the, the other one that was a big influence was uh, um, what's that Australian band, a tune band from there, um, a Disembowelment. When I heard the first Disembowelment album and how brutal and I, I think it was the ep i don't even think the album was out yet we had had advance we had advance of that album and that definitely influenced us too because that was, had a lot of really abstract heaviest parts on it and we we're just like yes that's what you know craig and i were in that mode we're just like we're not gonna make we're not worried about making the best album we just want to make the heaviest album that ever existed at least that we could do you know yeah, because the special thing about Mortal and Lazarin too is like it isn't necessarily like you say so fa fast. Like metal metal can be really fast, be brutal, but it's so heavy, it's so massive, it just pounds you like right in the face because of the enormous magnitude of the different tempos in in the in the album. Yeah, well, we, it was one of our things back then is that we were kind of we kind of were kind of bummed that. Like the doom bands were just doing like a doom or maybe a little doom death metal thing, and then other death metal bands are all about speed, technicality of it. And we're just like there shouldn't be no rules at all, you know. It's like as long as it sounds <laughs> heavy and makes you like makes you feel like you know the um, you know hell's opening up and that you're getting devoured by this you know dark feeling. That's what's important. I mean, you know, one of the things about incantation, I think that some people like don't you know, understand the vibe and they don't get the fact that it's about the feeling of the riffs not the riffs themselves not the notes not even if the notes are like played in the the way you're supposed to do things or whatever it's the vibe you get when you hear it if it, you know you want it to be kind of disturbing you want it to be you know i want people like a lot of people listen to this album where it's like what the fuck is your problem you know like you guys have issues or whatever and i'm like exactly that's what this album's for to get out all those issues to get out everything that's dark yeah. and pissed you off in life you know if you want to listen to my 14 year old mind to go. Death, you know you don't need to do death for me death metal should be the um the, the venting of everything that uh either sucks in life or just a good outlet to just you know you know like get out all your pissed offness you know like like I, like I said when i listen to stuff i really like it makes you just want to stab everybody like you know <laughs> and I'm stabbing people isn't good but it's a good feeling to be like yes let's just everyone has to die right now you know no take no prisoners kind of thing very nice but don't yeah. kill people okay i'm not i'm not condoning killing people but it is fun everybody die i'm god <laughs> <laughs> That's why we have them so we don't kill people. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yes, yes. yes indeed. But it, it is funny because people like um, have brought up to me when they hear Demonic Incarnate and it goes into like the in there, they get that feeling of like 
falling into the depths of hell kind of thing. And that's a great to, to be able to conjure that with the other guys in the band and get that on recording. It's fucking ex- cool as fuck to do that, you know, to make an impact. You just explained that ending and how I felt like so perfectly. <laughs> that was like so perfect. Yeah, well, was, I mean, we all put in a lot of passion to it. That's probably why even the breakup of that Oh, we're we're losing your audio, bud. Yeah, your audio is completely gone. You guys hearing the same thing as well? Yeah, he's been going in and out a lot. I didn't know if it was um just on my end that I was hearing it, but yeah, it's been going in and out a lot. Okay. It's okay. Going all right uh while uh, john uh, works with some uh technology uh like i all be why don't you share uh and our friend ed farshi as uh number three pick right away a uh, number two pick incantation perfect i mean that album is so good i mean like i understand all the frustration that they came around to making it but for me it's like it's so it's so massive it's like it's like a wall of sound that just knocks you over like demonic it's like yeah so yeah it's really cool to hear you talk about it i'm sending john sending you to check right now so you don't have to keep going (laughs) yeah (laughs) Very nice. All right, John, you want to do an audio check just to see if we can hear you? Uh, nothing yet. Nothing yet. Silent language, okay. the rest of the show. Okay, let's go to our friend, uh, Mr. Stephen Levin, while uh, John do some uh, some troubleshooting. Like, you're up, Stephen. Okay, so number two for me is a great Canadian band. What are you going to say about those Canadian bands? They know what's up. You know what I'm talking about. I know you know what I'm talking about. One thing I always loved about our friends to the north is that they incorporate a lot of hardcore elements into the metal. And that goes for most of the Canadian bands that I love so much. And it goes right back to the thrash bands all the way up through the death metal bands. And uh, man, Blasphemy Made Flesh, I really enjoyed listening to this today. I haven't listened to it for a while and I forgot it's just... It's a cacophony of chaos. It's just absolute insanity. And then somehow they bring it all together. And um, as I can recall, these guys were one of the first bands that really kind of like jumped around so much they didn't go back to playing the same parts quite often. Most of their song could be, each song could be three or four songs on its own. They have so many parts. And um, they're just all amazing players. I was lucky enough to catch Flo at a drum clinic that he did in Middletown, New York. There was hardly anybody there. Got him to sign this for me. He just went through all the basics, played some songs. It was just so cool to see that. Reed St. Mark showed up, so that was cool too. And, um, you know, just to pal around with these guys and uh, really like all drummers, like some of the tips that he was giving out, like there are a couple friends of mine that are drummers and they were there and they were kind of like in the back, like joking around and laughing. I was like, guys, you should probably pay attention to this because this is a real pro showing you like what it's about. But these guys don't play anymore. So I guess what difference does it make anyway, you know, but I love this album. Great players. Uh, you gotta, if you're going to talk about flow, you have to talk about the bass on this album too. What great bass lines! It punches through. He emphasizes parts that other bases don't. He does like a lot of like the heavy, like almost like the slap, like the, the pluck the string really hard and uh, just really good stuff. Um, if I was going to give this an America uh, rating, I'd give it a nine out of 10. Uh, my favorite songs were uh, Defenestration with the punchy ba- bass emphasis I was just talking about. Uh, Close Your Eyes. This may hurt a lot. I love open face surgery. It has an amazing melodic lead. And there we go with that word melody again that I used to think was so much my enemy. But the melody is always that hook. It brings things together. I love that. Uh, Serial Messiah is another one that has that whole melody. Born Headless with the blast beat. Mutant Christ. Super aggressive. Really good stuff. I love the way that they stop and go a lot. Can't really say enough about this album. This actually is probably my favorite uh, Cryptopsy album. Not that uh, the other weren't great too, uh, but I just really love this early stuff, especially the Lord Worm albums. And uh, when Flo actually posed that question at the uh, 
the event that I was at and he asked which uh, vocalist do you like the most I was of course Lord Worm and he was like well why is that and I was like because he is Lord Worm so I thought that that was the perfect answer because nobody did stuff quite like him so yeah 9 out of 10 Blasphemy Flesh great album uh, if you don't know it you should go check it out very nice very nice thank you so much all right Count Ralphus you're up your choice number two a uh, quick little fun fact about uh, a cryptopsy that I read just recently was that they're the first uh, band from the Western Hemisphere to ever play Saudi Arabia. I don't know. Oh, no, that's, wow. pretty, that's pretty weird places. That's pretty it's, badass, man. And it's not like any, like, for not just metal music, but uh, any music. Like, no one's toured there for whatever reason. But Incantation <laughs> will probably play there next year. Um, <laughs> <laughs> My my number two is going to be Bolt Thrower. Um, they're kind of similar in, in a way with Incantation where like they'll have the slow, heavy, crushing riffs, but the drums will be fast. Like everybody thinks it's slow because the riffs are like slow, but there'll always be like like fast things going on with the drums behind it. The production is is way cleaner sounding on this compared to the, the hellish uh, Incantations. Like it, this doesn't sound like you're in hell, but it's a kind of a cleaner production. You're in war. It's it's pummeling mm -hmm. and it's it's heavy as hell, and uh, I love it. It's classic bolt thrower riffs, and uh, I don't get bored with it. Very memorable to me, and they're one of my favorite death metal bands. So that's my number two. Very nice, right? Thank you so much. Uh, let's go with Tracy. You're up. Okay, I'm going to go with incantation. <laughs> Um, actually, I was hoping John would be here. Uh, it's, it's a shame to hear that he went through such a hard time with that. And I had heard that later on. But in the moment, you had no clue. I mean, it was just an astounding album. And the whole doomy element compared to um, everything else that was being played, really, it just grabbed me. And we've still got some of the best songs that John does on stage today. You know, um, and it, it yeah. it's yeah I, I mean it's just an impeccable album it, it really is i i really think that it it just grabbed me at a point in time when we were just hearing so many of the same things and john just had that element that and and it just it it was astounding there's no other way to put it um ivex moon is just classic you're going to hear that just about yeah, I mean, when he played it the last time, I actually filmed it, and it was astounding. Um, Thank you. Uh, so that's where I am with that. Uh, well, thank you. Appreciate oh, it. There, there, oh, there you are, John. Yes, I'm sorry yes. that you had such a hard time pulling off that album. But I'll tell you what, it had a <laughs> grace. We couldn't tell from our end because it had a grace all its own. It really did. Well, I think, I think part of it is because it's music's you know so dark and heavy and pissed off that having those extra feelings of having to be such a struggle to go through maybe benefited even more pissed off and dramatic or whatever you want to say so i think it did it, and, and, and it was it ends you, up being you could hear it from the gut you know what i mean you really could it was you know it was just yeah it's nothing like anybody else was doing at the time definitely you know, with the doomy yeah. element and yeah. Yeah, for sure. We were def definitely trying to kind of forge out our own path even more. I mean, that, but that was the concept with the band from the beginning. It was about doing death metal, but doing death metal our way, not the way other bands are doing it. Because if you want to listen to death metal the way other bands are playing it, you listen to other bands then. If you want to listen to it our way, then you listen to us. You know, we've always kind I'm of been identity. got it. Yeah, and just, um, you know, because of that, we were underdogs in the scene at the time because we didn't always fit in with what other bands were doing. People look at, look, some, a lot of people look down on us because we weren't just following the trend, but, you know, we would take that as a badge of honor. Like, okay, well, if you want to be a poser, that's your problem, you know? We're, <laughs> like, we were conf <laughs> confident where we were at, you know? We were confident we were cocky about it, you know, because we knew we were being ourselves. We weren't being cocky because we were the best players. We were cocky because we stood 100% behind, you know, the actual music 
part of it. Yeah, production wise, the studio stuff was a little, you know, was had some problems, but as far as the songs and stuff, the vocal songs mean a lot to all of us that were involved in writing it and it means i think a lot to even the members now in the band that have played on that stuff it is a you know something special there you know because because it was honest if it wasn't honest it wouldn't be looked at so long you know still as a important album in death metal which is yes something it more paved, its for. paved its own path so yeah for other bands to go in and bring in that that element yeah, it's nice to know that like so many bands now are used that as their template for what they're doing now, which is like super high honor. I mean, holy crap, you know, do you ever think as a musician that you're going to be that influential that bands are going to base their whole sound on one of your albums? Uh, that's, I mean, it's crazy to think about. It's hard to even believe that it's an album that I had something to do with, you know, that means that even though it's a small scene, compared to other things, it still made an impact in its own way, which is nice. Very good. Very good. Thank you so much, uh, Tracy. All right, Miles, you're up, buddy. Yeah, so for number two, I'm going with the almighty Bolt Thrower. Um, for Victory is one of my favorite Bolt Thrower records. Um, my opinion, this is one of the most punishing Bolt Thrower records. In my opinion, I like how everybody was talking about war because in my opinion, if there's a war going on, the side that's got the tank with the big speakers blasting bolt thrower for victory on it is going to win the war. In my personal <laughs> that yes. that's who's going to win, you know. But um no, Bolt Thrower has always been one of my favorite bands. Um this is not my favorite Bolt Thrower record. My favorite is uh War Master. But um this I, I struggle with where to put this one because it could be my second favorite, but I also do like Realms of Chaos like way too much. But um, yeah, one of the most punishing records I've ever heard. The title track for this song is, I mean, for this record is fucking amazing. It's one of the best death metal songs I ever heard. Um, Two other songs I really like, Remembrance and uh, Least We Forget. And uh, I'm saying one more, Graven Image is a really good song as well. Um, this this album is one of the most punishing records ever, and I, I love it. 10 out of 10. Very nice. Very nice. Thank you so much, Ma. All right, John, you're pick number two. Okay. Um, this will be surprising to everybody uh, knowing – my opinions on certain things, but I have to say <laughs> that my number three, um, and I, I didn't even come up with this until I listened to um, these albums again. Just for this episode, my number two is uh, Bolt Thrower for Victory. Um, it's it, it's an amazing album, and I love the album. I mean, I love Bolt Thrower. I mean, yeah, for me, my favorite's Realms of Chaos, and that, even really Realms of Chaos was an inspiration for me. I mean, when you heard this, that low end bass on that album was like, it was like everyone was like an explode, like it was like a bomb going off every time Joe hit the bass on that album. But uh, for, for Victory is a great album. I mean, it's kind of going in the same vein as, uh, you know, War Master. Like, they kind of refined their sound on, on War Master and they've kind of continued that on all the albums since. But I think it's, it's a great album. I mean, it's, um, it just gives you that feeling of it gives you that special bolt thrower feeling that at that time was very distinctive to them. And uh, I don't know who brought it up, but now, um, yeah, too many bands rip off bolt thrower now too much. Um, and to me, it's, you know, I mean, it's nice that they show tribute to bolt thrower and stuff, but at the same time, I think it's a, uh, you know, Bolt Thrower knew themselves that there was like a limit to what Bolt Thrower could do. That's why they didn't put out so many albums. Um, they stopped at what after Mercenary, I don't think they put out anything because I mean, when we were touring with them, I even asked uh, Gavin, you know, what, you know, what's the deal with that? It's like, there's nothing else to do. We've done everything we wanted to do. You know, it's like, why put out an album if it's just going to be 
the same thing, you know, over and over again. So I, I think that's really respectable that they kind of knew that their, um, you know, what they, their style it was like, they achieved what they want to achieve and, you know, leave it at that, which is good because all they could kind of do is go downhill at a certain point because people would get kind of bored with maybe hearing another album with the same kind of uh, riffing style. But for me, it's great, but I, I can see where they're coming from. You know, why do you want to be forced to write material just because it's time to write a new album? If you don't feel the inspiration, you know, why the hell do it? And, uh, and I also have a lot of respect for them, uh, you know, after the passing of their drummer to uh, quit doing the band out of honor to him, which also shows the fact that, um, you know, they really do, um, you know, they, they have a way where they are really stick to their guns and are really respectful about stuff. I mean, the dates that we did with Bolt Thrower, I really, um, it was really cool to be around a band that just is very honest to their beliefs and stuff. They were, they weren't, you know, they weren't into it for the money and anything. They, they were in it for, for the honor. It was like the fact that they were doing well was good and great. But they, you could tell that they really uh, stood behind everything they did. And they, they were stubborn. They wanted to do it their way. On the tour that we played with them, they basically booked all the shows themselves, just had door deals at the shows because they wanted to have the shows done their way. They didn't want to deal with going through promoters. They said, you know, and I thought it was really a do-it-yourself kind of vibe and stuff. And I just love that their um, conviction and it's almost like, again, a kind of a punk rock attitude, the way they do things, even though they're really pure, pure uh, death metal. Very nice. Very nice. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, to go for the rest of the folks for their number two pick, uh, Stephen Keeler, number two, was Incantation, uh, Mortal Drew of Nazarene, and of course, uh, Frank Tosi, uh number two pick was cannibal corpse uh as for myself um i think i went with cryptopsy um i mean these guys used to come to aggression shows they were little kids like 14 15 16 year old like breaking shit and like uh <laughs> so they, they were definitely like a, a little bit more rowdier when they were younger than after now like you meet them they're very <laughs> kind of like very calm guy but they were not like that when they were teenagers let me tell you um the cryptopsy uh my favorite memory of them is always uh you know like they, they were the, the definitely the second wave of like a quebec metal with cataclysm uh after like uh aggression voivod and uh damnation and oblivion uh started the first wave these guys were, were the second wave and jesus did they ever uh it was so heavy uh you know it's it's almost like for us was like kind of like just like pushing the material even further than what we started uh so uh we were uh, automatically uh, into them uh, these guys, Cryptopsy, every time they come to Vancouver, I well, way back, they used to come and stay at my house, and I'll always have this like amazing uh, <clears throat> imagery of Lord Worm sleeping in my daughter's uh, Dora the Explorer uh, <laughs> bed, which could not have been uh, scarier. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, so, you know, it's just hanging out with that dude, uh, you know, uh, and, and picking his brain. The guy was completely insane. Uh, he would give you answers to questions you didn't ask. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, he was, but he was so, so very mild mannered, super nice uh, guy. He used to come to my house, do his laundry, and uh, we just had like a, you know, he was, he was, he would not drink or do anything. Uh, but he, he would hang out and we would talk about like very like he, he would ask like a uh, question like uh, have you ever been like uh, followed in the woods by a tree and I'm like uh, <laughs> no, no. <laughs> like, did it ever happen to you he goes, oh yeah all the time 
So yeah, that's the that's the type of guy he was. But yeah, Cryptopsy, uh, I like that it's com- it sounds like it's complete chaos and that they don't know what they're doing, but they actually know what they're doing. Um, yeah, they're talented. Base but... base player's name is Eric Langlois. Uh, funny enough, he had the same exact same name as our aggression's first singer, Butcher. Uh, and for years, people thought it was the same guy. But very talented dudes, uh, but not at all the same guy. Uh, but yeah, uh, and I, I was really a big fan of John Levasseur, uh songwriting and Alex Auburn as well uh, when they were in Cryptopsy. After that, similar to John, like it's almost Cryptopsy is like six different bands because every time you have a new lineup, uh, it kind of changed the sound, kind of like changed with uh, whoever's in the band. Uh, but I, I like the like uh, golden era, I guess, the Cryptopsy uh, the most. And like Blasphemy from Made Flash is definitely uh, one of them. Uh, favorite song, Mutant Christ. I also like Abigor and Open Face Surgery. Um, these guys are legends in, in, back in Montreal. Uh, and they, uh, you know, like when, uh, when the f- first time somebody introduced me to them, I started listening to it. I was like, I felt like proud. <laughs> I felt like, yes, all right. We can keep, you know, like Voivod will never be able to be top in the like crazy, weird, you know, like you'll never be able to go that far. But these guys were like musically like doing things that were that, that were not done at the time. And I, I, really, I really enjoyed that. So that's it for round two. Now everybody's going to go through their to their uh, favorite pick. And since our my friend Ovi, my brother from Norway, uh, is uh, the one who uh, made us go through that. And Miles and I will make sure that we'll get him someday with some something just as difficult. Uh, yeah. Yeah, Ovi, if you want to go with your pick number one, buddy. My pick number one is Boltor for victory. Um. For me, it's the perfect Boltro album. It's it's um, if you would ask me like thirty years ago, it would probably be the War Master. But over the years, as I've got gotten older, I have noticed that the album I reach for is for Victory more because for me, for Victory, it's a much more mature album of Boltro. It's like it's more well rounded. It's like you have some parts like Remembrance starts, and you got a really speedy start, like. You got in battle, uh, or in battle there is no law, like start, like fast. And then you got like realm of chaos fast. And then you got the heaviness and bigness of war master. And then you got the slow parts from, from Victor for the fourth crusade. And then you mold it all into for victory. For victory is also, it's uh, taken from uh, Carl Willits, uh, vocalist, favorite poem. Uh, of Lawrence Beyond uh, Ode to Remembrance, which is is a uh, old uh, like poem from the World War One, and you got like from different countries it's used like from Canada it's used like with the different translation in French for like for Canada, but it's like quotation appears in Calgary Soldiers Memorial or the cenotaph of Grandview Park in Vancouver. It's like it's it's such a if you go into uh, what Carl will it's like put into his lyrics in 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 Voltrower, it's probably one of the things what makes Voltrower so good because the lyrics are like you know the lyrics and you just gotta go with it and you're in the battlefield and you just go with what he he grows and he is the perfect general that just pushes on. Uh, for me, uh, my favorite songs of this album though is Tank Mac Mac One and When Glory Beckons. And of course, my favorite track is from the poem. He uses this a uh, line from this poem in the, almost each album he makes, and that's Less We Forget. That's my favorite Baltimore track of all time. Very nice, very nice. Thank you so much, Ovi, and thank you for uh torturing us with your uh. With your uh, with your musical selection, there will be more. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, I got some more stuff for you guys. All right, yeah. all right, Mister Levin, you're up. So 
So obviously it only leaves one album left and that would be Mortal Throne of Apocalypse, my number one pick. Uh, maybe with what John was saying, with uh, the stress that went into this recording, maybe that's what brings out what's so great about this album, the, the despair, the hopelessness, the atmosphere, which is a word that I use a lot, but I love the atmosphere of Incantation. The only other band that actually comes close to matching what Incantation does with atmosphere and death metal is Immolation. So we're pretty lucky that both bands are pretty much from this area. And uh, so we're blessed for that. But uh, man, I can't really say enough about this album. I do actually prefer the recording of Upon the Throne uh, a little bit better. I mean, this album is ugly. It's dirty. It's scary. It does sound like hell. It's just got such an atmosphere to it. When you listen to it with headphones on at night, it's like, whoa. <laughs> another realm i just love that my favorite songs in this album abolishment of immaculate uh sermon it, it's so great uh pillard's vocals are insane i was so happy that we got to see pillard sing a couple songs with incantation uh last summer or the summer before geez i guess it was the summer before uh at one of ed varsity's uh events that was the one that you played out right danny yep 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 yeah that was amazing to see uh, Pillard pop up on the stage. And, you know, he gets a bad rap for a lot of stuff. But, you know, to see that happen was great. Um, other songs I love, Nocturnal Dominion, the Ibex Moon, obviously. But this album, the one thing on this album that's very special to me, it has my favorite incantation song of all time, Demonic Incarnate. I wrote down the time and I, I got it right in my notes here. So at 2.40, the atmosphere kicks in. The feedback starts. It's just like, dun, 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 dun. you got the atmosphere on the back, like the guitars getting feedback. It's it's so good. <laughs> John, you're a genius, dude. You're a genius, bro. And you guys don't rush through the part. You take your time. We get almost a minute and a half of this just insane, slow, doomy atmosphere. I can't say enough about this album. I loved hearing all these stories about it. It's one of my favorite death metal albums of all time. I mean, you know, I, I get what people were saying about the vocals being a little bit like loud for the mix, but it was scary. It was ugly. It wasn't like what anybody else was doing. And that's what makes this album so much so special. And um, it's not a popular opinion, but I do actually like this one even more than the first album. It's just the true Me classic. It, it's, it's so good. I mean, I can't say enough. So, uh, I guess I'll, I'm done tooting your horn, John, but thank you so much for this album. <laughs> so good, bro. And like I said, I love hearing the stories about it. And uh, as I said before, just like the fact that you went through so much with this, maybe that helped with the the that whole feeling of despair that this album gives you. It just, it's so, so doomy. And I just love everything about it. So yeah, number one, perfect. 10 out of 10, one of my favorite death metal albums of all time. Check it out if you don't know it, because you should. Well, yeah. Very nice. It's because they're yeah. falling into the abyss that the vocals are a little <laughs> in the Because they're falling it, into the abyss. Fire went from the heavens right into the pits of hell, cool. and you're stuck there, and you're not fucking getting out. And that's where right. I want to be. Yeah. A memory that I have of when we were recording, oh, oh, when I was doing the guitar parts for Nocturnal Dominion, the middle part, where it just like goes in the total doom with the feedback. It was something really cool because it was like kind of just like fucking around in the studio like i had the basic idea of what i wanted to do but it just kind of like i just kind of like hung out the note and let it feed back and we just said just go i'm just gonna go until it feels like it's time to fucking go you know like go 100 percent on just some, like some kind of steppy rock or something going like <laughs> i'm just gonna go you know, it's like it's kind of cheesy, but it just when we did it, we were first like, ah. you know, I was like, that's fucking sick. I had a, you know, kind of kept build part onto it, like that kind of uh, studio situation. Really, for that, just great. You know, the engineer being like, oh yeah, it's fucking sick. You know, and Craig was like. Dude, what the fuck? You know, it's like it's just a good vibe, but you know, you kind of when you really get something really cool going on in the studio, when you have all the guys there and they're kind of 
giving you that support like yes you're going in the right direction let's let's fucking you know make it even sicker or something like that it was just such a that was one of the more fun parts of that recording because it wasn't wasn't all bad it was, there was a lot of really cool stuff it was just um it was more it was more towards the end of the recording where things got more fucked up in the beginning it was all like really enjoyable because we knew we had something that was like we didn't know if anyone was gonna like it but we knew we were like like this is fucking cool this is like you know really pushing the limits of um of brutality and, and heaviness and yeah, I guess atmosphere and stuff. So it's really nice to know that it came across to other people because, you know, that was the closest we came to like hearing it for the first time. Was just kind of doing it and just, you know, kind of, you know, almost like free freestyle jamming it in the studio. But it, it came out pretty much. I couldn't imagine any other way now. You know, it's like an organic, organic death metal album. It's it's like it's alive on its own. Well, yeah, it was well. That was one of the good things about recording in the studio back in those days is that, you know, especially if you had a little bit of a budget, you know, you'd have be able to spend time like, you know, working out some of the issues. Like we, I had the basic idea, but I didn't know I was going to hang out like the parts so long and where I was going. Like I thought I was going to do the, like the accepted parts more in the song, but then once we just got to it and i don't know i just was like hanging waiting for something to happen uh, i might, might, might have even fucked up something or whatever but then it was like oh wait that's cool let's let's just you know figure it out like we didn't really count it out to know when to go for anything like it was actually it, the counts on that album were so fucked because we were just kind of winging it that the first version that we got the album the guy in the studio screwed up and like doubled the length of some of the parts in the songs because he didn't know when the first one, we didn't have any, any counts at all things were, you know, we listened back to it like, wait a minute, that part's totally wrong, you know, because it went like double the time, but yeah, it worked out, overall it worked out really good, I mean, I'm proud of it, you know, and it, I'm probably more proud of it, like I said, because of all the struggles and stuff, it's just fun to have that jam, but, you know, I have that same kind of vibe with Kyle when we're in the studio, especially when we're working together, it's like, there's just like a good fun team effort on things you know and it's just nice that you're, you're in this in the studio playing your guitar doing your parts or not sure about something and you see like other people like oh yeah that's good and that gets you in that vibe like okay let's fucking go with this you know or whatever john do you remember what guitar you recorded this album with yeah that was um that was with my blue ST um, guitar, the oh, Rick ST. Have... The one, it got stolen. That one. Oh, oh that sucks. Yeah, that was. Uh, it, it just, yeah, it was a Samantha Fox. I had the little Samantha Fox sticker on there and a Q sticker mm -hmm. on there, or something like that. Um, yeah, that, that was that guitar. I think I'm, I might have also brought the Mockingbird, but I don't remember using that in the studio. I remember using the. I, cause I used to use the ST as my main guitar. My Mockingbird used to be my backup until someone stole my ST, and then all I had was the Mockingbird. And then that's how I got kind of into using Mockingbirds, which I'm down with. I mean, I like the Mockingbird. It was just at the time, the ST, just, I don't know. I It was my first real guitar I bought, so I, I liked using it, you know? There's a nice one on the power cover. What's that? There's a nice one on the power cover. I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. I got cut you, off. You, you, somebody uh, must have a guitar somewhere. Oh, yeah, for sure. And, and I said there's a nice ST on eBay right now. Oh. In the bottom of it, and also... Uh, uh, oh, your audio's completely gone uh, again. Oh, oh yeah. Oh, fuck. It's fucking <laughs> shit. Now it's better. <laughs> <laughs> is it better now? So yeah, as, soon as, you, as soon as you said fucking shit, it came yeah. right back. <laughs> <laughs> what time yeah. it work? So just, course. just, just swear more, and I think it'll, it'll, it'll work. Yeah. <laughs> Fuck shit. Fuck. <laughs> yeah. Crystal <laughs> clear. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. All right. Thank Come you so way. much. All right, Count Ralphus, you're up, my friend. All right. So yeah, when I first heard this assignment, I uh. I thought for sure I was going to go with Bolt Thrower, but um, 
it, like uh, the last couple times Cannibal Corpse got put into one of these with us, I end up putting it at number one. I was kind of surprised. Interesting. Rock Fantasy, but um, yeah, this this uh, I also I don't hate this album cover by Bolt Thrower. Is everybody still there? I can't see if anybody's there. Yeah, yeah we, can, we can hear you, but hear clear. Went off yeah, back. I hear no. You hear yeah, me? I, I see. I can hear you now. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, the, the Cannibal Corpse. Uh, I love these over the top lyrics. It's so crazy and and so sick, and uh, it goes great with the music. And I love like the 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 really super heavy thrash kind of riffs, but the the death metal vocals and then the death metal drumming definitely makes it death metal but you put a thrash singer on there and then you would hear the elements more of the the thrash sound but i just think this album is perfect it, i i read that it was the fifth best-selling death metal album of all time but i didn't see yeah. what the other four ones were but um it's also their best-selling it's album Covenant by morbid was one of them yeah definitely and, uh, yeah, it's just, I mean, I'm not going to go through the songs because they're all catchy and memorable. I love the riffs on this. I love how much the bass stands out in this. It's it's a perfect recording. of Production-wise, I think it's got the best sound out of all these albums. And, yeah, I'm surprised once again, but I got to go with Cannibal Corpse. I know I say uh, Corpse Grinder is a better front man, but those first four albums, they, they got such amazing songs. And uh, I still worship those old albums. And all the new ones, they don't they don't really ever put anything out that I don't like. But uh, yeah, I have to go number one, Cannibal Corpse. Cool, very nice. It's still the most played. Don't ask me why, but that <laughs> yeah, it, definitely. It is, you know, you can't uh, you can't uh, you can't change what uh, you know. That's history, right? Like, mm -hmm. um, definitely. All right, thank you so much, Count Ralphus. Let's go to Tracy. You're up. Oh, well, we're down to bolt thrower. And <laughs> uh, I just, um, just the riffing in this and the transitions is just amazing. I, I just absolutely adore this album. I mean, any bolt thrower album that was at like, like was said previous, they were so consistent on what they did. And I'm not even a war battle person per se, but you just <laughs> couldn't take, you couldn't take it away from them. It was just a, a phenomenal album um every song just flowed one right into the other and um the production was wonderful and it was refreshing by the time the end of the year came it was very refreshing to get something that had some you know guitar riffing and and pounding you know because kitty was just freaking amazing on the drum so it was just astounding you know and um like was said before i think that they handled this very well Again, how many albums can you put out that has that similar feel? But they always manage to have the transitions going on. So you always had, and Joe was just amazing. You can't take it away from her either. She, you know, just astounded. I, I just love this Are album. I read this quite often. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, and, and I'm a cannibal lover. So for them to outdo Cannibal, and like I said, and if it wasn't for John in there, with that, that's an amazing album too. So it, it was hard with these four albums. It really was. I tossed it back and forth. I even went back to what I would have said in 94, you know, because we were riding the Cannibal high, you know? <laughs> yeah. You know? But, uh, I, I realized later on that the, all of these bands paved paths for, for different areas of of death metal to to expand each one of them you you couldn't take anything away from either one of these albums because they were all paving paths bro absolutely the yeah. best thing nice. about the early days was how many how much originality was going on it was the same thing with the thrash metal scene the first wave of thrash metal every band had a little bit different sounding singer the same thing with death metal. When death metal first hits, they don't all sound exactly the same. Everybody's doing different things, throwing it out there like incantation. No one was sounding like that at the time. So that originality really sticks out. And they're the bands that everybody is emulating today, you know. True. We got we gotta mention John Tardy because John Tardy slowly rot back in eighty nine. That was oh. I have a lot I did listen to it back in eighty nine, but that was like his vocal is kind of he has that guttural thing that <laughs> yeah 
All right, Tracy, and thank it, you it so much. So naturally for John, too. Yes, yes, yes. You know, it's very organic for John. Yeah, definitely. <sighs> All right, thank you. Let's go down the bayou uh, near near in Cibado, Louisiana, my friend Miles Gobuddy. Number one. Definitely Cryptopsy Blasphemy Made Flesh. Man, this album here. <laughs> I actually I remember I was talking about it after one show, and I forgot this came out in 94. Man, this this record right here is one of my favorite death metal records ever released. It's everybody that's talked about it so far. It it's controlled chaos, and I I'm I'm there every second of it. I love it. Um, Lord Worm, he's not human. I'm just gonna say it straight up. That dude is not a human, dude. His vocals. He's one of my favorite favorite death metal vocalists. And I I struggle to say which one's my favorite because obviously none so vile is a fucking masterpiece as well. But uh Blasphemy Made Flesh is like neck and neck with that record. But I I, I think I, I like his vocals on this one a little bit more. That little ooh that he does on this record, oh man, it gets me going. It just gets me going and and I, flow's drumming on this record. Flow as a drummer, I remember, so when I was learning instruments, I was a drummer. I went to drumming class and everything like that. And I remember I got a big head and I thought that I was like, I was like, I don't know, like 12, 13 years old. And I thought that I was this good drummer. I was playing these simple beats and stuff like that. And this one dude came up to me and he was like, hey, bro, you think you so good? And he's like, I'm like, yeah, you know what? I, I, I'm, I'm pretty much no. There was two drummers that he showed me. It was Pete Sandoval and Flo. And I was like, son of a bitch, I suck. You know, I suck, <laughs> you, dude. I, like, there was no getting better than that, man. And um, man, but did, like, like I said, this is one of my favorite death metal records ever released. Um, Lord Worm is an inhuman, crazy man. And his lyrics on here, just reading the lyrics for this record is so disturbing. But it fits this record. It just fits his vocal styles. The lyrics just fit so well. Um, My favorite songs off this record, I, I'm, I'm not even going to pick one. I'm just going to say the whole record. I mean, come on. Open Face Surgery, that scream at the end of Open Face Surgery, somebody from the Guinness book of world records needs to go listen to this song and record it and see how long that scream was held because i think it was the longest death metal scream ever recorded on an album it is fucking crazy <laughs> um swine at the cross born headless serial messiah like the opening get off of me you bastard like <laughs> That, that oh my god man and oh man that beginning and my favorite song off this record is everything but memories of blood that opening screen on memories of blood makes the hair on the back of my neck stand up and when i hear it it makes me want to run through a wall it just makes me i'm like oh i'm i'm here for totally on this album I know every album I said gets a 10 out of 10, but this one gets 11 out of 10. It, it, this one goes up to 11. Yeah, this <laughs> one goes up to 11. This, this, this is this <laughs> craziness. And, oh, yeah, Blasphemy Made Flesh. I'm, I'm, I can go on forever about this record. It is just amazing, in my opinion. Hello, we're dancing in the woods now. <laughs> like oh my god man that album is crazy very nice very nice too bad that uh, flow flow wanted to join us tonight but he uh he's actually working construction uh north of montreal and he's in an area that has no service uh, i remember he, say, he says hi to everybody and uh he'll try to join in the future if we do something like this I remember when you said in the comments, like, oh, yeah, Flo might be coming. And I was like, 
ooh, I'm gonna be starstruck because like that's <laughs> like when, when you're when you're when you grow up as a drummer and you listen to death metal, it's like that's one of the that's like one of the levels that you want to reach that d- level of drumming right there. <clears throat> Tones, that's that snare is so tight on that record. It's it's tighter than a gerbil's asshole. And it, I'm just here <laughs> for it every, every minute. And the feel, yeah, it's a perfect drum sound. The feels that he does, and I've listened to this record with just um the drumming, just the drum track on it, and it's like the bass kicks that he does is just like my mind is blown. Like I would never reach that level, but it's just nuts. Very nice. Very nice. I'll make sure, like, Plo listens to this episode. He needs to hear you talk about Flash for Me, Made Flash. I think he would be very proud. Dude. It's amazing. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much, Miles. John, you're up. And I got to go. Oh. I'll be right back. Somebody's knocking at the door. John, number <laughs> okay. one, number one pick. Okay. Well, first of all, I wanted to say about, um, about, uh, Cryptopsy is that, um, Lord Worm is definitely a stand-up dude too. One of one of the nicest dudes that I know in the scene. Um, I, I remember him from pretty early on because they we played a fest there before that an album out and we got to know him a little bit. But you know, for a while it hasn't been too much recently. But in the '90s, at least, he used to always come out to our shows and hang out, and even always give us a place to stay, and was always just really helpful. We had we had a couple of problems in Canada with some other bands from over there and he was always really cool and trying to help us out with whatever we needed. So uh, I definitely have a lot of respect for Lord Word. Um, great dude. And I, his vocals are impressive. And, um, you know, when I see Cryptopsy play, I miss, you know, the feeding of the worms to the crowd and stuff, you know, that was, that was a really fun thing he used to do. Um, but anyway, getting to my favorite, well, obviously it's uh, Cannibal Corpse, The Bleeding, out of these uh, four. Um, I wouldn't have picked that album if without listen, if I didn't listen to it again, because I haven't listened to that album, oof, I don't even know how long I haven't listened to it for. I could have not listened to it for maybe 25 years or something, because I wasn't really that much of a Cannibal Corpse fan. I was the exception to the rule. I mean, I didn't. I didn't hate them. Actually, I was I really liked them as people. They were like really great dudes, but I was just never really into the early cannibal stuff. At that time, my headspace wasn't into their uh thrash inspired kind of death metal sound they had early on, even though the songs are classic and stuff. Plus, I like I said before, I wasn't a fan of Chris Barnes' vocal style, especially on the first couple of cannibal albums. I, I just thought that they were too monotone for a low end but that's a more important thing but on, on this album i think it's probably chris barnes's best performance vocally. Definitely. i mean um yeah it sounds i mean i do agree it's too bad on some of the early six feet under albums uh, it, i mean now it's it's ridiculous back then it was an early six feet under album it was but I didn't really like his vocal style on, um, you know, when I heard uh, Eaten Back to Life. I actually thought it was pretty good when I seen him live the first time, but then on the album, and it just hit me the wrong way. Because uh, it almost, in my in my personal opinion, I always thought that his vocal style in general didn't fit Cannibal. Like Cannibal would have benefited more from somebody who who they got, like George Fisher, with more uh, a more dynamic vocalist. But um, getting back to the bleeding, I was really impressed with the albums, listening to it. I mean, I, I realized I knew a lot of the songs. It, it's impossible not to see Cannibal play, um, you know, and the this production is really good, I think. I think it has some really um, innovative riffs on there. I, I love some of the riff style. You could tell that they definitely were inspired a little bit by emulation on some of those riffs on that album. And I think, it, I think that's super cool. You could just... To me, it seems like they were growing to get to the point of the bleeding as far as like a band, you know, even though the songs, you know, songs on, um, uh, what's it, the uh, um, album before was it, Two Minute Mutilated, had some classic songs on there and stuff. You just, like, there's no denying that they've had ma- massive 
uh, amount of uh, classic songs, even on the first couple of albums. But this one, it seemed like it all came together. The, the production just sounds to me cleaner, but to me, it's heavier sounding too. And mm -hmm. they really excel when they're playing really tight um, together. And uh, even though I, I love Rob Russe, I, th I think he's a, a fantastic guy. And I, I loved the passion that he had for Cannibal Corpse back in the time he was playing in the band. You know, Rob Barrett definitely, uh, you know, was made that sound more solid. Um, it was like no denying. It's almost like night and day when you listen to the guitar playing on Two Minute Mutilated to the mm -hmm. bleeding. And then from that, from, it's almost like the bleeding on is like the next step in Cannibal Corpse. is like the beginning of actually the era that I prefer, I prefer the George Fisher era, but this had enough, like all the elements of the George Fisher era were at the, this album, I thought, except the vocals, which the vocals are, Chris deserves credit because it's the best, probably the best performance on there, even though it still is probably my, still, um, still way better beforehand and uh, afterwards, you know, um, I wish I wish that he still played did vocals in this kind of passion because um, I think it would benefit you know really put in that, that, that later stuff I hear what seems like it's all for vocals in my opinion but um, yeah I think it's a great album I mean it's a it's a strong album a lot of great songs on it. Um, I was just really surprised because I was expecting the whole as my favorite out of all these. Like, listen, is, up, is like, it the loudest ba bass mix Calibre Corps I had on album? Because the bass is real loud on that album. I really like it. But it works. Like, it works. Like, sometimes when the bass is too loud, it doesn't fit. It like, almost sounds like it pops out. But on this one, it, it still fits in the mix. It just keeps, it keeps there like this, this heavy, heavy, uh, to it or something on this album it's just something they found the the proper production that they needed to accent their songwriting in the you know in the best way it was like I'm mean, kind of like us we were kind of finding ourselves early on and they they got thrust in the spotlight so soon after the band that it took them a little while to really you know where where they all kind of excel, and, and and they also know the um, you know, like they're able to execute the stuff that they want to execute, and like here you can tell the talents there, and the and the, you know, ideas ideas are really great on this album. I don't know. I think the whole album's a great album. I don't really have um, a favorite on the album because it's the first time listening to it in twenty five years. It's hard to pick a favorite the first time you listen to something, but. Um, you know, it, it's a great album, and it's. I'm gonna definitely listen to this album more. Um, you know, a, after this, so I got something out of this, and um, yeah, it's, it's definitely my favorite Chris Barnes album too that um, he's ever did, in my opinion. Have you ever have you ever heard the uh, demos for while that they did with Chris before? Because there are demos a while with Chris yeah. before they recorded it. Yeah, I did hear it. it was quite a while. I don't really remember it, but I, I know that I, I know that I really liked when I when I heard uh, George Fisher with them. I if I want if I remember correctly, I think I see them live first, and I was blown away because I was like, all these songs that I thought were eh, okay, I seen I seen him front the band, and it like put all the pieces all together for me. Like, oh wow, this is really is something cool. So it was, it was just a cool thing to know that, you know, they were, Cannibal was already a pretty big band in the death metal scene. And George was one of those guys that we knew from back in the G. Williger days and stuff. So it was almost like seeing your, uh, one of your brothers that used to hang out with joining Cannibal Corp. So it was just like, that was fucking awesome. And the fact that they were killing it and, you know, they played songs like Skull Full of Maggots and, you know, all the classics back then, because they, they basically had Bile plus the first you know what four albums and i was like all those songs from the four albums like wow these are good songs i just didn't like the vocals that's what it was it wasn't the, the, the songs themselves plus you know maybe you know, a rob barrett um you know addition to help solid it up i mean i don't know i 
I never paid enough attention to know if Rob Bruce wasn't playing the stuff good live. I, I thought they were okay. They were not bad live, but once I seen them, I, I don't know if I seen them for the bleeding, but I know I seen them for the vile album. It was, it was impressive. What, well, oh yeah, Two Minute Mutilator, I think was the last time I seen them because that was when we seen them with. I don't remember who they the sacrifice them they tore it with sacrifice them. I can't remember, but um, yeah. Anyway, yeah, the bleeding. It's my favorite. I didn't. It wasn't expecting that, but it, you know, props to a cannibal, you know, and, th and thanks for surprising me after t 25 years or whatever, 30 years of the album being out. I finally, I finally like it a lot. Somewhere in this world, Chris Barnes is going. <laughs> <laughs> Well, he's gone clean now. He's been clean for a year. Has he? <laughs> yeah. yeah, but his vocals, eh? <laughs> he, need, he, needs, he needs to get back on the weed then because his vocals are sucking. So, no, yeah, but uh, start smoking. I, I know we're talking about George Fisher a little bit because of Cannibal, obviously, but um, I met George Fisher in the mall in Baton Rouge one time. And I was in this um little shop one time and I, I'm checking out and I look over and I'm like, holy fuck, that's fucking corpse grinder right there. <laughs> so I go walk up to him and I shake his hand and I'm I'm like one of the most nervous dudes ever in this world. And I go shake his hand. I'm like, oh, man, are you are you George Corpse Grinder? Like, I couldn't believe he was right there because I've never seen nobody famous in Louisiana, basically. And I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, are you George Corpse Grinder Fisher? And he's like, yeah, man. And he was trying to talk to him and he was talking to me. And I was like, I didn't know what to say and stuff. I was just so <laughs> thinking. And, um, George go, is easy to talk to. Yeah. Oh, yeah. He was one, And that's what I was going to say. He's one of the nicest, like, people I've ever met. And then I go back to my uh, my girlfriend at the time. And she don't listen to death metal at all. And she was like, I know that dude's, like, famous for some reason. But what is it? And I'm like... <laughs> I'm like, dude, I'm like, well, how do you not know? He's like the lead singer of Cannibal Corpse. And we listened to the Kill album all the way back. I'm like, uh, like all the way back home from Baton Rouge. I'm just like, listen, this is the dude we just seen in the mall. <laughs> so that's my little Cannibal awesome. Corpse story. I mean, George, George pretty much became one of the most iconic vocalists in death metal. Probably one of the most popular people in death metal. Um, well, well deserved for sure. I mean, I think it's because Every time they play, his vocal performance, I think, is stellar. It sounds great. It fits the oh, music. I love him. It, it like, I love it's, he does, corpse, monstrosities. Yes. Fucking great. Oh, man. He, I just think he plays, he just plays for the music. He, does, he, he doesn't just, uh, it doesn't seem throwaway. You know, you feel he's doing vocals. And that's, that's what I really love. It doesn't matter as much if it's low or high pitch. That that part isn't as important as you want to believe it. When you, he sings it, you believe it. You believe that he wants to fucking, you know, whatever, like fuck corpse or whatever, you know. John, you gotta swear once in a while to like set your audio. Fuck. Like, Still, oh, so, okay, much there better. Goes, much better. Like, Isn't it working now? Okay, yeah, I said fuck. So. <laughs> as soon as you swear, yeah. it's better. Um, all right, thank you guys. Uh, yes, uh, for the people that were uh not with us tonight, like I, I'm assuming Ed's favorite was Bolt Thrower, yes, okay, perfect. And then uh, for Frank Tossi, it was uh, Incantation, and for uh, nice. Mr. Keeler, it was uh, Cannibal Corpse, uh, The Bleeding. As for my number one pick, um. It's uh, Incantation, Mortal Throne of Nazarene. And, and I, I tried to say things that haven't been said already. Um, I think uh, I think something really, like, uh, tonight really uh, um, struck me when, when John said, you know, like, trying for us to not listen to the riff, but to feel the darkness attached with it or something like that. And uh, that's that's how I um, I take uh, incantation uh, every time I see them live every time I listen to them it's kind of a personal almost experience um, and it, it it carries me to kind of like a different world uh, but this one like uh, Mortal Throne Nazarene like just a quick story um, 
the guys from aggression uh I guess we were good people, but we we had a tendency to get in trouble uh, very easily uh, and very often and all kind of different level. Uh, so let's just say like at, at the beginning of the 90s, um, I was not able to listen to music for like two years minus one day. <laughs> Let's just let's just keep it let's just keep it at that. <laughs> and and uh, so uh, um, then uh, after that episode, uh, I went. You didn't get uh, privileges. Yeah, not many, not many privileges. No, and uh, in uh, then I remember uh, shortly after uh, going to my cousin Stefan and. Stefan's the guy who introduced me to like N2 and Brutal Truth and Incantation and all that. The guy is crazy French Canadian. Doesn't do anything else but listen to like the most obscure metal you can find on him. Um, so yeah, the first record I listened to after my time away from civilization, I guess, uh, was <laughs> was Mortal Throne of Nazarene. And I don't know like if I can can like explain the experience but if you go two years away from like metal it really changed so the first thing i heard after all that time is demonic incarnate and i was like what the <laughs> fuck happened like <laughs> <laughs> i was like okay so and and i thought like you know like it's true the vocals were kind of like low in the mix and things like that but i kind of liked it like that because I remember telling my cousin, like, is he singing or or is is it happening? What's what's going on? Like it sounded so like um scary and and um I don't know, like I, I, I just like everything about it and and um I you know every time I was listening to that like I guess like that post eighties metal, like all that that the other uh the other bands that came out and everything and all that music and all that like i always thought about oh man i wish like i would have had the insight to write music like that to play music like that in the 80s and and but that 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 uh that darkness and how that song is fucking crazy like to me like it's 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 like uh it's not how you would feel if you're in the woods and something, not a tree, not a tree, tree but something, you? yeah, something's following <laughs> you and you don't know what the fuck it is and you don't know if you're going to be alive or not. And, and you're just like in a state of panic, but uh, it's really good. Um, the Ibex Moon, also similar uh, than most of you guys. Um, I, I, I really, uh, really, really got me going. Um, and like you know the entire album like i i I think it it put me back into like uh okay let's start listening to like a lot of new stuff and you know it's it's funny like my <laughs> my cousin I, gave me like this incantation and then he gave me cathedral like forest of equilibrium at the same time oh, and i was like album. <laughs> yeah i was like <laughs> i don't know what's going on i don't know how to take the difference it, it was almost like too much but uh but yeah, it, it's um, it, it's uh, I'm glad I got to meet John like years after, uh, and I became a friends with him because um, you know I, I'm a huge fan of his uh, of his of his catalog and and you know being in a band, you know like as a listener you don't know what the fuck's going on while the recording's happening. You're thinking it's all peachy and everybody's happy and show up. But I mean, knowing being in a band, I can't imagine it's never like that. There's always issues, and you know, burning amps, stolen guitars, band members, attitudes, not showing up, drunk, not drunk, remembering parts, not remembering parts. Um, but I, I do love that you took the time to add some uh, studio, like uh, um, imp improvisation to to come up with. You know, like you said, you had a basic idea. And uh, I think I think as a musician, that's fun to go into the studio and then create something that's caught in time at that moment that then will be will be listened to for years to come. But that's what a mo that was a moment for you. Uh, it's such a such a great, uh, great capture. Uh, so, yeah, that's my uh, that's my vote. Uh, incantation number one. And yes, uh, I'll send my address with the check. 
you can. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> yes, I, uh, yeah, that's good. I, I made a little bit of money today. <laughs> Thank you, guys. So uh, the um, um, as I was like talking with you guys and listening to you, I also did the the scorekeeping uh, to make sure that we would have like a, be able to sort who's the winner of this uh, nineteen. For 30 fucking years, 1994, it seems like, I don't know, like, I always, I, I even think of, like, Kiss the Elder as, like, a most recent album. Like, <laughs> it's, it's so weird uh, it is in our head, but... Um, oh, I'm going to make uh, y'all feel old real quick. Yeah, yes, go, go. I was born in 93. <laughs> nice. Damn, nice. Dude. Yeah, a, a, um, older than you. A, a, fu a fun fact is that Day that Onward to Gothic came out, our guitar player Luke Shively was born the same day. Wow! Yeah. Oh, nice! Wow! That's <laughs> fucking crazy. Yeah, Luke. Luke's a fucking beaut, man. Yes, oh, he's dude, awesome. He's fucking one. He works so fucking good with you, man. Oh yeah, uh, he does real good. He re really, you found a fucking like right now. You're live. You guys kill it, man. Jesus. I'm very fortunate to have amazing people. You know to play live with and, and the, the great thing about it is the they're probably some of the best musicians I ever played with and they're cool as fuck too it's like yeah. the shitty musicians are the ones that are assholes <laughs> 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 the ones that are good really good are super cool <laughs> so john i have one question about the album uh Nasrin. ibex moon what is it and what's the inspiration behind it the the title well i mean and the song was written by Craig Pillar, the lyrics, but I mean, it, it's, you know, the Ibex, I mean, Ibex goat is just the goat with the long horns. It's basically, yeah. it's basically the, um, it's a symbol of indulging in your uh, animal instincts, kind of being like natural and again, you know, not, um, you know, just, just, yeah, just being primal. A very, it's a very primal song. It's, you know, a lot about indulging in your sexual desires and just your and not to be ashamed of who you are and what you want to do and you know it's it's it sounds uplifting but it's actually pretty demonic because you know people are real are really the um problem in every <laughs> in everything yeah, you are. know you are the we, warriors but, of the world yeah. but i believe but i and i do believe that um that concept of being uh, true to your animal instincts and you don't need to follow uh, religion. I mean, some people do and, they, you know, they get something out of it, out of it good for them. But for me, it's like if you, you should do things because you know it's the right thing to do or you know it's fulfilling what you need to fulfill for yourself. And um, in a way, that song is kind of based around that kind of, um, you know, a concept. It's, it's Yeah, because I was checking, I was like, Ibex is the Asa goat, but... Yeah, it's an Asian goat. Uh, there, is, there is no moon with that goat on, so... Look, look at look at the thing right behind well, me. Yeah, I was about to say right it's behind. right behind yeah. you. It's just this, the, yeah. the goat is a symbol of, you know, indulging in your animal instincts. You know, it's, you know, I mean, we're looking at it from a more blasphemous way and a more, like you know, being at one with our dark feelings and indulging in say our depression or anything that we have and just, um, you know, letting, letting who we are take control of, of our lives and not let our lives be controlled by the, I guess the status quo or the religion or whatever, you know, kind of stuff. But I mean, um, I mean, that's what I get out of it. I mean, um, of course, Craig wrote the lyrics, Craig Pillard. So, you know, maybe he has a, a slightly different take, but I mean, from back then, I remember we were, you know, we talked about it or whatever, because I thought it was a very cool concept. And I, the more, the around the time, even though our band was kind of falling apart, by the time we did um, Moral Throne Nazarene, Craig started to um, expand his, voc his uh, lyrics into stuff that was, was more deeper into him. On Golgotha, it was, maybe not quite as deep, it was more blasphemous uh, stuff. And on this one, it was more um, more personal and more um, de dealing with his, I think his inner demons and maybe coming to him, him, you know, being proud of who he is himself, even though it isn't part of what is, um, you know, 
what is a status quo you're supposed to be kind of thing. I'm not trying to be extra, you know, all um, you know, serious <laughs> about it, but you know, you, you asked me, and that's yeah. that's what it's about. Yeah, it's nice. It's the the pagan slash like just do what fuck do what the fuck you want. <laughs> yeah, do what you fuck you want. Take you know, and if yeah. you do, if you act like an asshole and you get in trouble for it, then you know you you deal with it because Perfect. it was your it was your choice to do it. But you, people should stand behind you know, their, their beliefs and, um, not be ashamed of who they are, you know? I mean, you know, that's the kind of the, the, like, on uh, the album has the orgy scene, the orgy scene has to do with, you know, the Ibex is the Ibex moon, um, influenced artwork because it has the deal. It's dealing with indulging, like I said, in your sexual desires too, in a kind of a, cause it has, you know, it's like a blasphemous orgy or whatever. That's probably what Stephen Keeler is doing at the store right now. Uh, yes, he's yes, he's having a blast in this <laughs> orgy. <Wait. night>. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I guess Obi, you ready for the score of your uh, the, the the pain you caused us? Are you ready for yeah, the, the first like first episode? Yeah. <clears throat> yep. Um, and yes, I I okay, yes, I didn't mention Frank and. Uh, Stephen Keeler's number one choice. So uh, at number four, um, my friend from Quebec, Cryptopsy, uh, came fourth. UDA. Uh, yeah, and Miles like, what the fuck? Dude, <laughs> I'll, 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 that. I'll never Dude, talk I, to you guys again. Dude, no, I love. I just love that album, man. It's a great yeah. album. No, it's, it's, it's the best. I agree. I think I think for some people, it, they they also like the album. It's just against the other three it was just that's a personal oh no i i totally agree this was one of the hardest episodes i've ever done it's it's difficult because it's it's more of a preference to what style of you know death metal because they're all the bands are are different enough where it's not like you're not really comparing apples to apples you know yes Yes, they're all it's close still close enough though i mean it's the same style but it's different different enough at uh at number three Cannibal Corpse, the bleeding, um, which it for a number three it got a lot of number one selection, so it was a very close call with the other two. Uh, yeah, I mean, yeah. Uh, the biggest surprise for me, I think, uh, of the night uh, is Bull Thrower at number two. Um, so, like, let's just like I'll give you guys the points because it's it's give you a better picture. So Cryptopsy, 19 points. Cannibal Corpse, 24 points. The Boltroar at 28 points. And number one at 29 points. So just edging uh, Boltroar wow. by one spot is our friend John and Incantation uh, winning the this 1994 uh, 30 years released ba- battle that our friend Ovi uh, submit us to. So good gotta, win, John. I got to put more of my albums in these things and be on the show so I can get more. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. No. I, will, I will say this. Um, I, I'm not the biggest fan of um, doomy death metal, as we will say, but like incantation, just because they came out at number one, is always the go-to for me because – just hearing y'all talk between this and talking about the feelings that this this kind of music brings is exactly what I feel like whenever I listen to these albums. It's 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 just like whatever John's talking about is the perfect example of what I'm feeling like. So whatever he was trying to put out with these albums, he did a damn good job because I know for me personally. That's exactly how I feel when listening to these. And I know yeah. I had it at number yeah. three, but ah, like I good. said, this was, well, this was, this it was, was hard, definitely a tough. this was tough. This was tough. Yeah. Trust me. I know I, when I seen the competition, I'm like, oof, I'm fucked. These are some good <laughs> fucking bands, you know? But, I, I, I said it before, like, it's, I feel like uh, bands like, uh, like Incantation, Immolation, um a lot of the bands right now like i think like the metal scene overall is definitely getting like a boost um i know like here in vancouver 
shows are all sold out. Doesn't matter. Like Dead to All and Cryptopsy are playing two nights, and I think there's barely any tickets left. Wow. Uh, and, yeah. and and it's they ain't coming by me. I'm fucking mad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it's it's uh, you know, like to see like a band like and of course like Amon Amart, they're a big band, but for them to play in a ten thousand seater arena in Vancouver, BC. Uh, and it's like sold out is ridiculous. Mm -hmm. Um, so it it's and it, it's you know it's us doing this kind of episode, rock fantasy file, and 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 pushing the the pushing the material and uh, going to local shows like you know like Mr. Levin, Count Ralphus, even John, like we all we all go to shows all the time, try to support the band and things like that. And you know what? It's That's a grind. It, it's it's a hard battle but i think like that it is growing I, maybe john you see that when you play shows places and things like that but yeah um crazy what's happening out there we're getting the young people i'm yeah. really shocked we're Definitely. seeing more young people involved because yeah. i'm um i would say i'm in the younger crowd because i'm 30 but like you got bands like um one of the big bands that I really like is Skeletal Remains and they um they're really good and yeah. you know you got your Frozen Souls and your 200 Stab Wounds and um uh mold another two, band two mold. that I, uh Two Mold and another one that I'm not a big fan of but I see a lot of people a big fan of is uh that band uh Sinquizio Bog and yeah. um you know they're 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 still giving and another one that's out there that's really good is Molder, and if anybody's yeah, Molder's great, it, yeah, they're great, man. And that's just like younger guys playing death metal and like this grindcore death metal. That man, I I was just like, I'm glad that people my age because I'm such a big fan of death metal and they're putting out death metal that's really really good right now. Yeah, yeah well, I like I like to be able I like to see that there's lots of different style of death metal bands that are doing quite well these days, which is good because in the past it was kind of like there was one style, which was really popular and kind of trendy and the other styles kind of fell to the side, but now it's like people are more open to, yeah, the more grindy stuff or the more technical stuff or whatever, the more doomier stuff that, you know, whatever, you know? So I think that's really good. And I, yeah, we've seen it a lot on tour. I mean, Honestly, the band is pro pro probably doing the best we've ever done. If you if you rate apples to apples from any time in our history, we're probably doing the best we are doing ever at this point, which is mind blowing to me because you know, first of all, we had amazing albums and lineups, with great band members and stuff, but it's just the scene is more fertile now. There's more people interested yeah. in it, and more people that are listening to those bands like uh, you know like creeping death and um you know uh frozen soul or uh gate creeper that are you know getting into music from them and then going backwards and finding you know the say listening to the bands that influenced them or something like you know for for us you know yeah like listen to band like two mole or something like that is you know those people go back and listening to where they might have been influenced from and they find us in that you know you mentioned cool. you mentioned something key though is that you know even though incantation has been around forever the the latest records are like bang 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 it's fucking awesome shit and a lot of it like i was listening to the new saxon uh you know like recently and i was like these guys gonna get more fans just because of their perseverance and how fucking great they're like album after album over the last 10 years it's amazing shit right so talking about talking about new bands uh my band that i've been talking about like i like monochromic black which are going, going to tour actually with uh, with john in august for dortmund death fest oh. then then it's, then it's incantation it's memoriam with and yeah. it's monochromic black it's miss 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 mystery index and vader and skeletal remains yeah i think suffocation i seen got on there too the new flyer yeah. um so then, then, uh, the dortmund death fest yeah in august yeah but I, and i think with old with older bands that still put out good stuff you could tell 
which bands are honest and passionate about it if they're still putting out good material after a while and what bands are kind of just um you know dialing it in yeah some of them i mean so too many bands i think live want to live off just their history and it's good to respect your history but if you're in a band you want to create stuff too i mean we i love performing but if we weren't able to write new music and release new music when we felt like it was the right time to do it you know it would be um you know would i, I personally i'd be feeling like something was missing because i don't write the songs for people to like i write songs because i feel like you know i i want to write the fucking song or whatever or the other guys in the band want to want to write stuff or whatever it's not about um you know oh it's time to do an album and let's you know see what's going on and try to fit into it or whatever just you know you just write it and like you know all, all around just write it. that's why it's almost like um you know there's been low times in the band because we've just done it our way. And we're just like, screw you guys. I don't give a crap that new metal's popular or symphonic metal's popular. It's like, we're going to, you know, put out the album we want to put out, you know? And we did it at those times. And we're just like, okay, no one likes it. Who cares? You know, screw it. We like it. And that's what's important. When you finish an album, you want to listen to it and be like, I'm proud of it. And then if other people like it, that's cool. And if they don't, okay, they're, they're allowed to be posers. It's no problem. But at the end of the day, I think true fans see that. Yes. Like they see the fan, they see the bands that put out the albums that the band themselves want to put out. And I think that's w- where the real fans respect that the most. Yeah. Because they know they know that this band right here, such as and since we're talking incantation, every time y'all put out an album, it's like I know that this is the songs that y'all want to write this is the songs that y'all want to put out it's just not like you know what what will be popular yeah this is what i flavor want of the out. month Correct. i mean it, it it's it would be way easier if we were a flavor in a month band because then we could just listen to what's <laughs> popular and just copy it and do it and now we'd probably be super big at it you know just for doing it you know but it's like yeah you know not into it you know i gotta do for, it for gotta do it our I, way and that's yeah. it you know? But I, I think in general, the public is definitely looking for more variation. I, I think we're, uh, as a whole, becoming so much less genre specific Yeah, mm-hmm. as a whole. You know what yeah. I mean? We want to see I that organicness. We want to we, we want to see it live and see the passion. Yes. And one thing before we go, I wanted to bring up, too, is that... Um, you know, Denny, what you're talking about when uh, we first met or whatever, it was, uh, I probably, I mentioned this before, but it was a very special moment for me too, because, you know, Aggression was one of the bands that was a big inspiration for me early on. I loved that album when it came out. And, you know, I was playing in Revenant at the time when it came out. And um, it was definitely a big inspiration for me. So, it's always nice to hear that, you know, he enjoys the music we do because part of our DNA was, you know, listening to bands like Aggression. And they, honestly, they were one of my favorite thrash bands of the, of the 80s, uh, like the mid to late 80s. And it was one of my favorite thrash bands in the mid to late 80s before I even thought, I thought it was impossible to meet anyone in the band because they're they're just they're not around anywhere nobody you know i i think i met like one of them back in like 89 when i visited montreal with my friend zaz and um the cremains guys but that was it you know but i was also like super drunk um (laughs) you know then and i barely remember i just remember like bragging about how amazing aggression was and to be able to uh you know work with them on the channel and just be friends with them and you know, being able to watch him play live and stuff is was a dream come true. I mean, when I seen him play at that, what was it, Farmageddon Fest, was it, I think? It, I yeah. couldn't believe it. It brought back my, um, you know, what, 16-year-old me or 17-year-old me. And I was just like, I felt like that kid. And that's the beautiful thing about music is, you know, when you hear stuff like that, it just strips away all the years and just you feel like you did when you first heard it, at least for me that's how passionate um you know i am 
about um, the bands that I grew up with and stuff, you know? So I just wanted to bring that up because you said some kind stuff about me and it's important <laughs> to know that you're very, um, you know, it, it's, it's, it means a lot to me, you know, and I'm super happy that you're doing the band still. Well, I, I, I speak my mind. I wouldn't, I wouldn't say it. Uh, I've been divorced four times. <laughs> Trust me, I, I, I speak my you mind. You have a maybe. lot to write about. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know, on, on Valentine's Day. <laughs> Yeah. Take it from uh, a woman who's never been married. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys, we're gonna we're gonna wrap up yes. this episode yep. because I'm just uh, gonna do a shout out. Like, what the hell? Yeah, I'm we just, go? yeah, I'm just gonna do go? a shout out for uh, for Monocomic Black because they're playing at the Sherry Street Station out in Connecticut on Saturday. Yeah, awesome, awesome. Hoping to make uh, it out there. Yes. Yeah, go and check them out. Yes, definitely. And please make sure to uh, subscribe to the channel. Uh, we're trying to, uh, we want to spread the, the love of heavy metal. That's our only purpose. Uh, educate people on what we have, like our, our passion. Uh, so please subscribe to the channel. Spread the word. Talk about the Rock Fantasy Files if you can. Yeah, don't uh, be a poser. Share, share the post. Do what you need to do. <laughs> and then uh, us will keep uh, chatting, drinking beer, and uh Compliment, compliment each other on, <laughs> on, on the screen. So, have a good night, everyone. Metal rules. Hell yeah. Take care, gentlemen. Bye bye.